Heza, you know what this one is? This one's episode 250. And how special is that? How special is that to you? Episode 250. They said it would never happen. Many people in the court system especially said it would never happen. <laughs> but here we are. And how meaningful that is to everyone listening that we've made it to episode 250. No one gives a fuck. Um, it's the World Cup that's been going on. Shane Watson, one of our very best friends across the journey, across the course of this life, this 250 episode life joins us from India to give us the lowdown. We're talking Sheffield Shield. Who's going to replace David Warner eventually? Australia did the business against the West Indies in the ODIs. That's before the WBBL starts. Hashtag Ask TGC. And of course, one of our also very good friends, Gideon Hay, is in studio to discuss all things in a very special chat. He's just going to, he's just going to discuss all things. Wow. All things in the show. Um, Pezza's support for this show comes from our dear friends at Patreon, where we're hitting record numbers there at Patreon. Uh, you can find uh, Patreon, our Patreon feed, TGC Patreon on Spotify these days to unlock the episodes. You can also join us at patreon.com forward slash grade cricketer. We're doing reviews after the audio. Uh, sorry, the audio for those reviews after every India, Pakistan, England, and Australia game. This World Cup that lives on Spotify. You can search TJC Patreon on the Spotify feed there to get the audio. We're also doing hashtag Ask TJC Fridays. We're enjoying. A lot of correspondence from the patrons recently, which has actually been sensational. You can join our community there at patreon.com forward slash great cricketer. Pezza, episode 250, they said it would never happen. Yeah, did they? Yeah, no, I agree with you about the court system for sure. Uh, <laughs> definitely been efforts to curtail <laughs> that many episodes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but here we are. You're right. It means fucking nothing. I saw JL hit 250 once. At the SCG. This you saw it? Mine. Yeah. You saw uh, it. You know what? No, was, I didn't. Was I lied. Because I think it was two, 223, I think he made, he, against India. And Australia were wearing those um, – do you remember it was like the height of the – of like Howard era Australia? I think it was – it must have been the year 2000. I'm honestly going off nothing on the screen okay. here. Turn of the century shit. They were, and they were commemorating like, you know – 1900 Australian team and they might have worn like darker yes. black coloured caps. Yes, I remember. And it had um, Did that like it a had, tassel? Yeah, it had I think it had a tassel in the photo but it had a shorter brim, like the kind of brim that um, mm. uh, that uh, what's his name? Um, Tom Hanks was mocking in a league of their own. Like <laughs> um, when he says to the umpire, "You look like a penis with that cap on." Right, right, right. Uh, and JL made two hundred and twenty-three against uh, like a forlorn Indian side, and um, he nicked a lot of balls. I remember that. Didn't he score a two fifty against India at the MCG? Yes, he did. He did. He and did. that was he after did both. he did. And that was after he released his book, "The Power of Passion." Right, okay. I just remember that. I remember reading it, like devouring it in a day. Did you read the shit out of it? Oh, fucking oath I did. That's good. Yeah. That's and, good. Uh, and then you read his book and get inside the mind of JL. Yeah. Uh, and an exceptional mind for an individual player. Yeah. What he could get himself to do, what he could rouse himself for, not mm. just running through brick walls. I've rarely been roused. Seriously. Yeah. Uh, really. More roused than... Yeah. than uh, then reading Power of Passion, and then you read it, and then the next day he goes out and towels up India. Wow, with uh, two hundred and fifty of the best. Well, I tell you what, let's let's talk about the World Cup here because that's the, obviously the main tournament that's going on at the moment. Mm. Pez, most people are aware of that, and you can get that coverage on YouTube if you want our dailies. Yes, on YouTube. Yes, or across YouTube, and of course the the audio for those reviews live yeah. on Patreon, mm. um, where you know you can find this sort of stuff. It's time for cricket.com stat dog. <laughs> Part of the sponsorship arrangement is to uh, is to release this. Cricket.com is our proud sponsor of our of our World Cup reviews, and uh, right. part of, part of one of the segments is a statistical rundown generated by their wonderful search engine or some shit. Yeah. And uh, we call that segment Stat Dog, and it's just taken on a life of its own. Yeah. Um, and how many people have just turned down the volume in their cars yeah. just then or their phones wherever they are? Such or just an assault on the senses. Assaulted that is. and jarred, yeah. and we oh. apologise. 
But I tell you what, our producer Charlie, that's some of his absolute yeah, finest work. Best. So well, well done. Um, anyway, yeah, World Cup, yeah, yeah. So, but just generally in the studio this morning, Pez, mm. there's been there's been a there's been a bit of energy. There's been a bit of energy in the studio because, I mean, this result last night, Australia beating Sri Lanka uh, by five wickets, about 15 overs to spare after such a fantastic start by Sri Lanka. Uh, they were none for 120 after 20 overs. Mm. But the, the boys got the job done thanks to some players that play for the Australian team, Man, uh, namely Pat Cummins, who apparently was dropped, uh, according to one radio host. That was the rumour. Yeah. <laughs> radio <laughs> Captain Cum radio host. Um. Anyway, uh, but I feel like I, I needed that in my life. Yeah. In terms of being emotionally, Our business didn't need it. No, it would have been much better for the view mm. count had Sri Lanka done the business. But unfortunately, they uh, they fell short of that target that we had set for them. Um. But just emotionally, just being me being invested in the World Cup. Now, of mm. course, you know, I I like the cricket generally speaking sometimes. Yeah. And uh, but you know, you've got to have a team in the fight. And because this tournament goes for seven months, I think it is. Yes. For Australia to be essentially knocked out after three games, like unfortunately Sri Lanka have been, uh, it would have made it a, a real long haul for the rest of the tournament. Because, yeah. like you know, just generally speaking, you want a dog. We have, yeah, I wanted the dog. Yeah. I wanted the dog. It's in a fight. Yeah. Now I'm invested in it. Yeah. Now, just generally speaking, you know, we've been very fortunate over the last few years to follow the journey of where, like, we feel like the future of cricket is going, and, and obviously that is for the most part in India and Indian cricket and and the power of such. And like uh, mm. India have started so fucking red hot in this tournament that they are just the absolute clearest of clear favourites to take this thing home mm. um, or keep it home, I suppose, given the tournament's being held there. Um, that like, it's like, oh, an another thing, another thing for them. They, they've had all the good times forever, even though it's only been sort of a couple of years, but still. Mm. But I say like how much I needed that for me yeah. and my investment given all the conversation. I feel like last night the Australian public started to wake up to the to cricket, the, the Cricket World Cup being on because really? pe people were banging for blood. Yeah. I just got- Well, that's a, bit, a national sport. I got a bit more of a sense that people were invested because people, fucking solar panel, Pat, he's got to go. You know, oh, yeah, it, yeah, we, yeah. we had, it was heading towards, and look, yeah. that's still there. We've got Pakistan on Friday. Yes. So, you know, things can change pretty quickly, but um, I needed it. Well, let's have it I right. guess I'm saying I, I, need, I needed it. I, th I think most, if we're, if we're fair about the tenor of discourse in Australia, um, let's go with the major headlines. Clayton Oliver's been in hospital. He's yeah. out, thankfully, uh, and, and I hope he's well. Sydney's picked up Taylor Adams and Brodie Grundy, reunited yep. from their time uh, at the Pies, I think. Yep. <clears throat> Shane McAdams is moving to Melbourne yep. after being traded from Adelaide. Is Jack Ginevan on the trade table? Mm, that's interesting, is isn't he? it? Um, is Dylan Shield moving? Mm -hmm. um, and who really is the trade whisperer? <laughs> <laughs> so let's just have it right, because that's the majority of my feed. Yeah. <clears throat> but then on to Australia's fortunes. I like what happened last night with Australia bending Sri Lanka because, as you said, knives are being sharpened. Mm. You know, it's getting to the point of, are we about to fall off a cliff mm. in Australian cricket? What's wrong with the Australian cricket team? How insipid and limp has it been for eight games or whatever the fuck it is, where yeah. before that we were number one? And, like, it's great because we've had a couple of years of calm, really. And yeah, the things, team fought, things, things have been pretty the, good. The team fought very, very hard for that. You know, it was really post sandpaper. They fought very hard as a bunch of maturing, growing adults for an environment that was reflective of their adulthood, their independence, their stature in the game. Uh, but Australian cricket, if you zoom out from that, mm. basically, like, uh, the ideology basically oscillates between process and passion. Mm -hmm. And we're just starting to see the call for passion. Yeah. Ahead, and yes. that's a good. That's yes. good. That's fun. Yes, like because we also recognise that we we recognise well, the passion. You've got you know. There's a story from a couple of years ago. Um, another Australian defeat uh, to to the home side, like away, away from home, and a senior figure. You know, he's on the bus on the away bus. Mm. He's exasperated at another meek defeat. Now, this isn't even this doesn't even have to be the Australian side. This could be any club side okay, around yeah. Australia yep. at any time. Yep. He barks to the defeated Australians. Mm -hmm. You've got to want it more. You've got to want it more. You've got to be tougher. You've got to be harder. Yes. It was about eight to 10 years ago, eight to 15 years ago. Yes. Upon receiving his plea, a Austra senior Australian player responded, well, that's all great, but how do I stop nicking the ball to second slip? <laughs> <laughs> so we have, yeah. you know, that's, there's passion mm. versus process. Mm. 
we have a reflex to resort to aggression in the face of deficiency. Yep. And I've got to say, it tickles me a little bit. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, we yeah. all get tickled by it. So, like, we've seen it here. Once Australia starts playing badly in cricket, yep. the first call that goes out is axe the woke bloke. Yes. Axe him. Yes. Clark even rumoured rumored that it was happening. Yeah. No, I turned on the TV and Cummins was tossing the coin. But <laughs> blokes are yelling in the field now. Yes, you know, I like uh, that. It's tempting. I'm now seeing Ponting hype clips from his World yeah. Cups in 2007 going, yeah. if you fucking doubted me, you better fucking sit there. Now, he didn't yeah. insert those words. That's my emphasis. So there's a great clip going around about yeah. uh, Ponting reflecting on the 2007 World yeah. Cup win that they had in the West mm. Indies where apparently Australia went into that tournament not as favourites. Now, yeah. like, there was a journalist who was in the press conference before yeah. the first game saying to Ricky Ponting, you know, how does it feel coming into a tournament for the first time in a few years, having won in 99 and 2003, oh, yeah. you know, not being the favourites? Yeah. And Ponting was like, Ponting fucking crow's feet deluxe, deluxe rightfully yeah. so. Yeah, when right. you think he about needed, the players in that team, some, by the way. Uh, hyaluronic acid after that. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to this journalist, like, I want you sitting right there at the end of this tournament. We'll yeah, see how we go. Yeah, see how we go. That is fucking And, and you put the music around it and stuff. And you're oh. like, oh, I'm fucking feeling things. Yeah. We all have it in our bones. I'm a, look, might surprise you to learn, I, I like the mature, calm approach in an Australian team that's not being cunts. Well, okay, now that makes yeah. me that makes me a cuck. I okay. appreciate yeah. that, and it makes me a beater, right? Yeah. And, and yeah, it does. Okay, and, well, and, but, but you know, but I go against you there because I like to see guys who really want it. Yeah, that's what you I'm know, saying. It's a, it's a question of want, because, and that's where Australia was heading into this game. I understand, uh, and it and it makes me ask, what has Ronnie done? In, yeah. because you're not expecting that from the baritone king. From the bass voiced king, you know, like he is the um, embodiment of process and calm, and, and so is Pat yeah. Cummins. And and, and mm. they're in India. Yep. All they have is a golf simulator yeah. these days yeah. and a coffee machine yep. to fix things up. But what has At he best. done? Was it a five hour nude fielding session? <laughs> was it was it a, was it a twelve hour drinking session? Mm -hmm. What was it? Like what what did he do mm. to unleash the hardness? Of the Australian team, the hard nosedness yeah. of the team, because I just saw there's one little part. No one's no one's picked this up from the Australia Sri Lankan game. We didn't even pick it up on our review just now. But Zampa takes a wicket, he gets someone out or some shit, yep. and <laughs> and and Steve Smith runs into him just behind him. He's probably come from mid off, mids off or on. Yeah, and he and he kind of like simultaneously like hisses and growls into his face and grabs him, and his head juts forward. See, that's a guy and, who wants it. And I see that, and I'm like. That I, I saw the same look in Ponting's crow's feet eyes. Yes. And now now I'm back in Australia and I've yeah. got mood swing problems, obviously. Yeah. But I just want, I, I want to praise Andrew McDonald and the leadership for bringing that hardness back into the side. I thought they were out of ideas for a period of time there where they were testing the hard nosedness of the yeah. players, including throwing Zampa into a pool wall. <laughs> you know, they were testing that out. Is it hard enough? Turns out the bloke's injured. He's got no hip. He's got no neck. So he's, he's got, got no, no Jimmy shoulder. Jack. He's got no Jimmy Jack. I've no Rocky Bowler, no Jimmy Jack. I, I've been screaming horse nonstop. <laughs> 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 All of a sudden we're rowing two. Yeah. We've got Sri Lanka. And what about the what It's none for 120. What Do they fucking want it? Didn't Zorby dig in? No Jimmy Jack, his hip's not working. Yeah, and, sol know? and solar panel pat yeah. through the stump sound. So got Tufa. Yeah. Davy Warner's taking a couple of catches, digging his knee into the turf there. <laughs> <laughs> Brad Hodges on the show. <laughs> 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 and, now, and, now, and now and now, the rest of the world is quaking in its boots. You never know, you know? man, because like you're just trying to find where the truth is, right? And uh, Australia have had – they've faced the two form teams of the tournament so far, India yeah. and South Africa. Now, Australia's standards in World Cups and just cricket generally is so fucking high. It's like, I don't give a fuck who we're playing. We need to win every single game. Now, like they are, they're, times. They're 0 and 2 and not just 0 and 2 they were fucking pumped. Yeah. Uh, in both those games, coming off the back of what happened in, of course, the last couple of games in South Africa as well. And uh, and then you're playing like a gnarly game where like Sri Lanka have, um, you feel like they have good players to yeah. excel in the conditions. And I also think like the World Cup being in India, it levels all the teams so much more because I feel like when you have tournaments in Australia or uh, in England where the wickets, um, how would you describe those wickets? I suppose truer of, truer of, uh, truer of bounce, truer of pace, the standards, oh, sorry, the gap between the, the worst team and the best team feels much farther apart than obviously Afghanistan being beating 
England last night. Well, no, they were favourites for that game. Well, that's what people are saying we'll on the internet. That, yeah. <clears throat> um, but uh, you know, so then you have this like this this gnarly game where like if, whoever lost that game last night's out of the tournament. Obviously, not officially because six 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 wins it feels like is going to get you in. But um, having that game last night and then they started so poorly. I mean, they I thought they looked fucking ordinary for twenty overs in that game last they night. They were, they were, they were dog shit. Um, and all these little things just weren't sort of not only like not going their way, but they were just making bad decisions. Mate, burn review first. It was it yeah. was like it's the classic. I said on the review, like, Ace of Base. I saw the sign. Like like they had the signs of a team that was struggling yeah. and not at the races. And they looked so angry at each other. Yeah, they looked angry. They were scowling. They, 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 they burn a review first ball. Stark's blowing up. Then he tries to – he issues three man-cad warnings. Yeah. Joel Wilson's giving nod outs left, right and centre. Yeah. You know, Max is yelling at guys. Mm. It's, uh, you know, they're pretty close to hearing someone yell lift, you know, which is yeah. like literally the, the death knell for anyone on any cricket field yep. when someone just goes lift, you know, like you, you're literally there in the 10th over. Your opening bowls of bold dog shit. And you're in trouble from the captain because you can't rouse any energy because most of you are running to get the ball from the boundary. Yeah, you know, like the the, bowl, the bowlers were insipid, the 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 batters were on fire. Uh, you're dropping catches. Yeah, everything's going against you. It just looked like it's one foot on the plane gear. Hundred percent. You know, like how many times have we all played club cricket games where you your 37 year old bank manager captain yes. who's having a bit of a tough time at home because his missus has gone through his phone and found yes. those text messages yes. halfway through and over. He brings the entire team in. The game yes. stops because he says, "Boys, this isn't fucking good enough. Yeah. Do we want it enough? Yeah. Do we standards lift? lift. It's a it, how many it, times, Pez? Like it's infinite. It's it's countless. It's really like on any cricket field. Once somebody yells that out, you've actually lost the game. <laughs> and then by game, I mean like your career. <laughs> it, it, like at some point in your career, when you're playing, yeah. when you you know, say you get to your early twenties, so you're a veteran. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've played enough. You've played enough cricket from the age of ten. Yep. Like so, so the start of your memories are five. Yes. You started cricket at age ten. You're 22, mm-hmm. and you're watching people go by to the beach, etc. Sundresses, rippling muscles. We've been through it, and someone yells out "lift." Mm. Like that is the most depressing moment. Like, like you know, the opposition none for 62. Yeah. Especially after what the captain had said, you know, b- before you went onto the field, mm. rousing you with an AFL speech, saying things like, "Let's take our chances." Yeah. Pressure from both ends. Pressure from both ends. Top of off. Let's give them nothing out there. It's like, yeah, mate, I'm, I just, I'm in cover. I'm going to give them nothing. What does that mean? <laughs> Lot of energy walking in, just fucking clapping, like trying to fucking, like, yeah. And you start saying like your old club teams when you start saying, come on, boys, walking in with the bowl. But you yeah. say like, come on. Like, it's like, oh, that's my old club team because yeah. you've changed three you times because you think you're a talented you second grader, but you're playing in four still. Yeah. yeah, and you're all over the shop. <laughs> crossing, uh, you know, changing, like like crossing in between overs, you walk past the both batters who are meeting mid-wicket and you hear them laughing. Yeah. Yeah, that as well. They just they seem way more relaxed than you'd like yeah. to be. Yeah. Someone says, hey, it's a good shot for us, but nothing's a good shot for you anymore. Yeah. Indeed. Especially since he got hepatitis. <laughs> he doesn't want to be here. And mid-off, you swear you hear mid-off go, none of us do. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's, that's where Australia was at that's none where they for were. They were. We'd all seen it. <laughs> the, so against that backdrop, they have done well. I was they at home. Well. The, I was at the home living room. I started to walk in with the bowler just to try and give some. <laughs> Come on, boys, live. <laughs> Yeah. Just to try and be part of yeah. it, you know? Same thing at my end. Maybe that's what we should do, just try and get, like, go live. You see if we can get people to start fucking lifting for the nation with online posts and whatnot. Yeah, yeah that's right. Taking guys on. Something replica jerseys, but yeah. spikes in the house. Right. And your missus says, no spikes in the club. Yeah. <laughs> So that was that's that was what Australia was facing. Anyway, Australia's back in it. They've won the yeah, one game. Yeah, that's right. Oh, they're sitting pretty in the uh, you know, Mate, at, the, the, at, the, at the turn. The uh, the the tournament goes for some. They've played three of nine games that they have to. They're going to go in and out of form four more times. You know, South Africa have just been so outstanding in the uh, in the games they've played mm. so far. They play against uh, the Netherlands tonight. You've of mm. course fancied them to, to win that game, though. Of course, can't they, keep it up. They literally have um, you know lost to them before last year in the T20 World Cup in Australia at uh, Adelaide Oval, I think it was. Um, 
But, you know, they're, they, they're playing so well that, of course, they should win that game. And then they'll be, you know, three wins. New Zealand are three wins. India are three wins. But, like, the other teams will have to play against each other. Exactly. England, England have a tough game. Guys it's, will take it's, games. It's so hard to – I mean, I I was listening to Simon Duell this morning on mm. um, Creek Buzz, I think it was, and uh, and – I agree with him in that uh, I think if the team that finishes fourth is probably going to get in on net run rate, I do think that's probably likely because, like, I mean, the way India are playing, they look like they'll never lose again. Same mm. with South Africa at the moment, but of course- Which they, actually means they will. They will. It's just like at the start of the tournament with predictions. It's like, oh, I think it's going to be the big three teams in Pakistan. Yeah. Or as I, or I can assure you, yeah. that's definitely what it won't be. It just yeah. never goes that way. Nah, nah. It just never does. No. Nah. So- uh, Australia's sitting pretty, really. If you think about it, yeah, I mean, I was saying before, you know, Australia, Australia's had a couple of tough games with uh, with form teams, but the standards are such. Given and like knives were being sharpened last night because we're, Big I mean, time. Well, we, we were talking about it even last week. It was like this. This feels like they are so flat. They look so tired. England looked so tired when they lost against Afghanistan as well. Like um, the importance of this World Cup is just so hard to to um, to understand, really. But I mean, given what has happened to the format since the last World Cup, that's also the reason I think that. Um, Teams can't win 10 games in a row because no one's played the format in four years, really. I mean, I was listening to a Sri Lankan journalist last uh, last night or this morning just saying the same thing. They've hardly played since, you know, every every country, every country has hardly played in four years. So, like, to have a, a great run of form for a tournament, I, I mean, it, se- it seems unlikely. Though at the same time, fuck, India look majestic. They look so good. Well, that's the thing. Like, it, But they're playing at home. It means probably more to them to, than any other country. And, like, yeah. if Australia wins the World Cup, it's it really will be a nice to have. And if Australia gets dumped out of the World Cup in ignominy, oh, damn it, mm. ignominy, um, it, it'll, it'll, like, barely cause a ripple in the country. Yeah. It's a, the opposite of love is apathy. Mm. That's and, and I think that's connected with the general feeling and the general approach to this World Cup as well. Is yep. like, it is a calculation that, unlike a lot of Red Bull series where Australia has most of its eggs in that particular basket. Yeah. If it goes south for Australia, and it very much could, this could be the illusion of recovery for sure. Mm. <clears throat> uh, it, it'll it'll have an effect on people inside the cricket industry and maybe like, a you know, a rusted on cricket community. I, I don't think there's going to be much beyond that. Uh, I think uh, culture war, people will want to see Cummins suffer. Yeah. I'd get the impression that he wouldn't be holding on to the ODI captaincy after this World Cup, even if they win. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and, and then and then we just sleepwalk into a summer of centuries and montages and beating up on poor nations that can't afford to play that format. After this World Cup, Australia playing some T twenties against India, <laughs> like a, like a week after <laughs> I that. Cannot wait for that series. And then they come home and then they start the Test summer, I guess. Yeah. But like after this World Cup, when's the next ODI series? I know I'm I'm guessing you don't know that, and I'd be very concerned for your livelihood. Generally speaking, if you did, if you were across that, that's fucking weird, man. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> fucking yeah. weird. Yeah, I'm not going to say now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Actually, seven games against us. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, like I mean, the how serious this format should be taken, generally speaking. But I mean, it's just looking also depends good for, on how well we do, I guess. Exactly, um, but you know, Australia going to any tournament semi final is the absolute bare minimum. And uh, you know, I guess at the moment, Australia having won last night in a sort of uh, in a tricky game, I guess are still on course to do that. Um, mm. But they don't look great. Uh, they don't. I look hope Hetty's on a plane. Well, apparently he is. Apparently he's, apparently he's supposed to arrive in India on, on Thursday. The game against Pakistan is on Friday. I can't see if he's going to land on Thursday and the game's on Friday. I don't see how he's going to play that game. But the game after Pakistan next week is against the Netherlands. Oh, if they can just jag a win against Pakistan. Yeah. You know when you start doing that when you start playing the table after no, three exactly. games? No, exactly. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. If they could, if they can, yeah, and then they could get heady into the side against the Netherlands, hello, yeah. and then somehow fuck someone else off and get Agar New, back in. New Zealand's the game after that. So, mm. uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just like how um, English English got fucked off at Cam Green of the uh, the T20 yeah. with that golf club incident that uh, no one ever saw. Um, all right, should we talk about uh, the, the the big shock of the of the tournament so far? There actually hasn't really ha- there really hasn't been many amazing games. Like nah. even even India Pakistan on Saturday night nah. it, was, it was a bit of a fizz. It wasn't a, it wasn't a great game of cricket. Um, Pakistan lost. Fuck what they lose eight for. Eight for forty or something like yeah. that. Eight, no, eight 36. for 30, 32? Something. Yeah. Eight for eight for fuck all. Um, 
And then India chased uh, 192 or three down, something like that. Already forgotten. That's how forgettable that game was. So even a blockbuster that was that game of 100,000 people, 100,000 plus people at uh, Ahmedabad there. Uh, hasn't been many great games, but a, a good game or at least a, a shock result. And I'm going to keep saying that because anyone who disagrees with me is a fucking moron. Easy, easy. Um, <laughs> um, Afghanistan beat England. Uh, Afghanistan had not won had not won a World Cup game in 17 attempts. The last time they had done that was against Peza. Scotland. In 2015. Yeah. And uh, England, obviously, current T20 champions, current ODI champions, um, already having lost the first game against New Zealand, to be fair, but then smashing Bangladesh, thanks to the Darwin Milan century there in, uh, that was Dharamshala. Uh, Afghanistan beat them by 69 runs in... Was that in Delhi? It was in Delhi, I think it was, uh, at uh, Aaron Jaitley <coughs> Stadium there, the Kotler. Uh, so uh, unbelievable result. Uh, Afghanistan winning their first World Cup game. Obviously, they had already lost to Bangladesh in their first game. And then was that their second game, um, Afghanistan? No, I think they played someone else. Me, I've, got it, I've got it here in front of me, so bear with me. They uh, lost to Bangladesh, lost to India, and then beat England. That's Afghanistan's run so far. And they're sixth on the table, two ahead of Australia, who is in eighth. Uh, anyway, um, Afghanistan, good for them. Yeah, uh, I th- they probably exposed England a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I think England are a bit unders from what we've come to expect from them in the last couple of years. I think they've been they've been at the forefront of the – like. Uh, with with dynamism and innovation, yeah. in white ball cricket. Uh, not sure what ails them, uh, but there's no Stokes in the side at the moment, and their their bowling doesn't look as their, their bowling looks toothless and lacking in the potency that we've come to expect from them. Uh, yep. The difference in the middle overs spin offerings from England and Afghanistan was uh, pretty major. Yeah, and uh, it seemed to be where the game was won and lost. Mm. Uh, Afghanistan got themselves to a point where they could bring on their tweakers to do their bu- to do the business, and they did. You yeah. Know? Uh, so, um, you know, it's a it's a great win for them. Afghanistan, as you said, has lost their previous seventeen World Cup games. Yep. And they've beaten the defending champions. Uh, it's w- it's without doubt an upset, mm. and um and and awesome for everything that's going on in Afghanistan at the moment. It just come through, um, you know, horrendous. Earthquakes, yeah. Uh, not to mention everything else going on there, and and Rashid Khan spoke beautifully about what it means to people at home. So um, fucking awesome for them. Um, you mentioned before about England's bowling because obviously in 2019 when they won, they had Jofra, they had Liam Plunkett, uh, Stokes was bowling as well at the time, of course. Uh, and this time round, uh, am I missing someone else? There might be, but. Um, uh, this time around, they've got Reese Topley, who missed the mm. first game, but he's been pretty good in the last two games. He was very good against Bangladesh. Um, they have got uh, Chris Wokes opening the bowling for them. that hasn't worked out at all. And they've got Sam Curran, uh, who's bowling first change, middle over stuff. It has not worked out at all so far. Their reserve bowler uh, is Gus Atkinson, who, as I was listening to the, the guys on the Wisdom podcast the other day, say that his entire list day – career for 50 over cricket is 33 overs mm. that's his that's the entire stuff that he's played so just sort of fits into this stuff that no one has played 50 over cricket at all since four since uh since four years ago um but uh i was telling you before i was watching uh rashid khan in the warm-up in, in between innings mm. against yeah, um against england and he warms up like on the side decks bowling with two balls in his hand so he, he grips two white ball two full-sized kookaburra white balls in his hand and he just bowls it down to the bloke with a mitt. Oh. And like, and they both make it down the other end. It's like, how fucking big are his hands? I mean, they must be if he's buying- He's surely not, he's not class. spinning. He's not like he's bowling him. wrist spin with He's it. spinning him, yeah. That's just not fair. Yeah, it's spinning him, yep. Fuck so he's, he, he, his fingers are slight, they're not fully around like the top ball yeah. on his hand, but yeah. Unbelievable, like how strong his hands are for a start, oh, but also the, the, the size, size of the of mitt. The size of it. Oh, what I wouldn't give for a handshake. Man. Oh. I mean, yeah, we've said it. I don't want to labour the point, but mitts are everything. <laughs> Get out of here. Get out of here. Where does, where does it sit in, like, Genie 3 Wishes? <laughs> and you can make, you can make you know, changes that help other people in life as well. But, it, 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 but it, that it, would also help if your hands are bigger. Help the world. <laughs> <laughs> you can make a better contribution to the world. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Do you save one for yourself? You know what I mean? If we're being moral about it, yeah. there's got to be two for everyone. 
You may, maybe, maybe just give yourself a little treat. Well, your first one is obviously three more wishes. <laughs> Fuck, those people are annoying. <laughs> Last meal. Oh, yeah, tapas. Multiple. <laughs> oh, fuck, you've, du- you've, you, you, you've outthought the hypothetical. For my first one's never in a packet of Tim Tams. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just called Uber Eats in my house. Well, um, speaking of Uber Eats, actually, uh, yeah, in relation go. to cricket, uh, 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 the Barmy Army uh, posted this. But well, um, uh, it's a question on whatever they call it in England. Uh, oh, no, I think, I think it is in Australia. It's who wants to be a millionaire? I can see the Channel 9 bug on it. And yeah. uh, there's a guy looking at it. sort of looks like a really young Alan Shearer. Okay. Uh, and the question is, in, in, cricket, which of, <laughs> oh, yeah. in cricket, which of these is not a type of bowling delivery? <laughs> yeah. A, off cutter. B, out swinger. C, bouncer. D, Uber Eats. <laughs> <laughs> Should have asked Monty Panasar that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if that's an ad integration. Yeah, Uber, good question. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Good question. Yeah. Good question. Little, it's like, a, you know. Fun, a fun way of integrating the ad, yeah. yeah. It's funny how we, we love, like, oh, that is the dumbest question. Yep, most people will be like, yeah. if I know. Well, you got it all, wrong. all sounds pretty fucking weird. Yeah. I mean, that's actually that's actually Cricket's next thing, to actually mm. start having delivery sponsored by a company. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> I'm now just thinking about <laughs> and the- And Aramco. <laughs> oh, he's got him there with a the suck my cock gambling. Dot com. <clears throat> um, anything else you want to talk about for the World Cup? Or we should talk to Water, who's actually in India. He's yeah, on the ground. Let's go to Water. Okay, here he is. He's our close personal friend, Shane Watson. Okay, one of the dearest friends of our show joins us for the first time in a little while. Uh, yes, you know him as one of Australia's greatest ever three format players. Yes, you know him as a global in-demand cricket coach. Yes, you know him as a World Cup commentator, but if that wasn't enough, now he's become a best-selling author and source behind the psychology book, Making Waves Among Thousands of Players. I'm referring, of course, to winning the inner battle, um, where Shane Watson's now signed a deal for a new version to be published by HarperCollins in Australia and India. So get that book while it's hot because it's seriously running out the door. Um, this is, of course... The man, as you as I look down the barrel, looking like an absolute picture again. Oh my god! <laughs> Every time I see him, it's straight out of the shower. Yeah, just looking a million uh, bucks, a million. I did just get out of the shower. <laughs> <laughs> of course, talking about, I'm talking about Watto Shane Watson. Uh, Watto, thanks for joining us on the show. It's always a pleasure. Um, anytime I need my confidence build up. You guys know how to do it, so I appreciate it. It's very All right, so well, let, let's let's knock it down. Um, no, Watto. Um, <laughs> Okay, Sri Lanka, 120 for none, burning reviews, three man-cat attempts or warnings, a <laughs> couple of tough chances go down, Joel Wilson saying fuck off. Uh, <laughs> with all your global white ball experience, you mm. must have had concerns at that moment about Australia's World Cup campaign. Oh, I certainly did. And it was a, it was a follow-on from the previous couple of games, just – Lacking a bit of intensity in the, well, a lot of intensity in the field, a bowling, even though in the first couple of games, uh, Stark and Hazel with a brand new ball had been very good. They just bowled a few too many loose balls. And like Mitchell Stark, you could see he was a little bit distracted by a couple of um, run out opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> What are they, what are they called again? What are they, they called? Right? Call? Yeah. I'm sure get my terminology right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have to change. Yeah, um, that's good. So, so we just looked a little bit, at, Australia looked a bit off again. But the two things that gave me hope straight away, as soon as Pat Cummins came on to bowl, he was different. He had more energy behind the ball. You could see he had a bit more intensity, a bit more sort of up and going in, in um, this game. And then as soon as Dave Warner took that catch in the outfield, so 125 for none, and then the first wicket that Australia got, then things changed. And it and for me, it was, it's disappointing that it had to take a wicket to be able to change the intensity levels because Australia's World Cup campaign was, was on the line against Sri Lanka. They really needed to win that game to be able to keep it sort of on track a little bit. But then once it turned, they really, they really turned it on. It was, it was really impressive to be able to watch. The fielding really improved. Um, the intensity levels are cutting down balls, and the bowling really got up and going as well. Pat Cummins run out. He hasn't like 
he hasn't done that for a little while. And, it's, we, and not just Pat, but just the team. We haven't really seen the team create a chance like that for a while. So that's when you know the Australian team's up and going. So that's awesome signs for, well, last night because they played so well and that, that flowed onto the batting. But for the future of this World Cup campaign, they were that's where Australia needs to be, and that's the type of cricket they need to be playing. They look uh, they look absolutely knackered to me, Watto, almost as knackered as my voice at the moment. But, um, I mean, they played in the in the last, uh, you know, what, this year, Border Gavas- what, Australian Summer, Border Gavaskar Series, a lot of the guys played in the IPL, World Test Championship, Ashes, home for five minutes, uh, bilateral um, series against South Africa, into the World Cup. The guys look exhausted. Am I making am I making excuses for the players? Is there a reason to be tired? Were you ever tired? <laughs> Occasionally you do. When, when you've got a big workload, it does get a bit tiring for sure. Um, and they certainly, Australian, did look a little bit, just a bit fatigued for sure in the first couple of games. But the one thing that I always go back to is India play more cricket than anyone on the planet. Mm-hmm. They play much more, they, and they have been for the last 10 years. All their players just play nonstop. And the Indian cricket board, BCCI, manage their players incredibly well. Occasionally, they'll miss out on a tour. The big, the big players will miss out on a tour here and there, knowing that there's big series or a big tournament coming up. And India, even though they've been playing nonstop, from game one, they were, yes, the conditions suited them in Chennai to get them up and going, that's for sure, against the Aussies. But they don't look fatigued at all. They look fully energised. So, look, that's Australia needs just to manage that a bit better because you don't want an Aussie team going into a World Cup campaign that comes around every four years and are a bit tired and fatigued. So, look, there's for me, there's no excuse. You see India up and about, then they play more than anyone. So the other teams have no excuses. So what? How? How? I mean, you're you're a coach these days as well. Like, how, how do you turn around a team when they're they're flat or low on form and energy? I mean, on the internet, I don't know if you've seen circulating this week. Uh, there's a there's a picture that we're all very familiar with. Some of us have in our lockers of um of three ex Australian cricketers with their shirts off. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. The Johnson, boys. Roy, days. and Watto. Wow. And oh. you know, I look at that as a symbol of. You know, how, like, I reckon there's a lot of people who want, you know, the, the woke captain gone who would look at that picture and go, like, that's the way Australian cricket used to be. You know, that's how we got up and about, just a good session on the bench, rigs out, let's always have a look at each other. I don't know where I'm going with this, really. How do you, um, how do you turn around a team that's low on four, Bono? Um, well, look, I, was, I wish those days, well, those days are a long, long time away. Oh, you look so, all right. Um, the setup looks okay. Different now, but, <laughs> but look, that's that's the skill of a coach is to be able to really find the motivation for the players to be able to step into what they did last night. And it shouldn't have taken a wicket, as I said earlier. It shouldn't have taken a wicket to be able to really get the team up and going. But things did shift, and there was an obvious shift. So whatever... The coaching staff, Andrew McDonald and Pat Cummins talked about in the lead up to this game, things did shift and it was a very obvious shift. So in the end, as a coach, you've just got to find the right ways to be able to just motivate the players just to to let go and just go in and take the game on. And that's Australia when they're playing the best. And that's when all teams are all people in general are at their best is when they are really up. They're really up for the contest. They are desperate to be able to engage in the performance and just keep doing it over and over again. And the Australians last night certainly did. Um, but that is the challenge is when you've got players who are pretty fatigued and, and tired is to motivate them and f- make sure that they have got no excuses after that game that they've stepped into what they need to, to bring the very best that they've got. Um, you mightn't catch this uh, back at home. There's been some nerves about, uh, you know, what might be becoming of Australian cricket and whether this side is staring at an embarrassing tournament um, as the game drew closer. Uh, ex-Australian cricket captain Michael Clark said that uh, he heard a rumour that Pat Cummins was uh, going to be dropped. 
Um, so how good did it feel to tip him off uh, <laughs> that that was going <laughs> to <laughs> Nice one. That's a, that's a great question. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I heard – look, I heard that before the, the last game that Michael Clark had come out and said that Pat Cummins should get dropped. Look, that's, that was, that's very extreme. Um, Pat, look, there's no doubt he'd been a bit off in those first couple of games. And in one-day cricket – and even T20 cricket, his bowling hasn't been as effective as it is in test cricket. Um, but we saw last night how quickly he can turn it around. And it just comes down to just a bit more intensity that the ball actually skipping through the wicket a bit more. Whereas when he's a bit off, the ball can just sit up a little bit more. And and we've seen that in one day cricket and T20 cricket when he sort of hasn't been as effective. But last night, he, he showed exactly the skill that he's got. So uh, it was a good thing he didn't get dropped because he wouldn't be able to show that last night. Um and then his athleticism in the field, he's a great athlete. And that, that run-out chance, he made the most of it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a great sign for Australia that he he led from the front last night. And it, you could tell he really just was sick of what had happened in the first two games. And it was time for him to really set the tone and set the standard. And he certainly did that, which is a great thing for Paddy because he's such a great guy, but also for the Australian team in their World Cup campaign. Obviously, it's such a long tournament, what I was. I mean, nine games, six, seven weeks, whatever it is. But with England, I wonder how you think they'll be feeling given that, like, you, because it's such a long tournament, you can have a blip and you can come back. But when you lose a game that you really don't expect to lose, that being basically Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Netherlands, maybe Sri Lanka as well. Um, but, like, how will England be feeling now that they've lost to Afghanistan so surprisingly? knowing that they've basically got to be nearly perfect to now make that top four. Yeah, England were yeah, surprisingly off um, in that game against Afghanistan, and, and they were they were definitely off against um, New Zealand as well. Um, considering how, like, this all this big bravado around Baz Ball and we have set the – and they have played incredible white ball cricket over, you know, probably since 2017. They've been the leaders in really taking the game on, especially from a batting perspective. But to be able to see they were just a bit timid, they'd just been a, a bit off for sure, and Afghanistan were absolutely brilliant. So, um, look, England, they are going to have to turn around things quite a lot to be able to actually – Win games against the best teams. Mm. The way the way that this you know what they've shown these two two out of three games. So look, I know Josh Butler, and he's a very cool, calm, and collected guy. Has sort of said, look, we've been in this position before, and they were in the in the T Twenty World Cup last year when they surprisingly lost to Ireland, um, but still went on to win the the T Twenty World Cup. So look, they've done it before. Ben Stokes has he's been out. Um, it was interesting to see him running running drinks. But not playing. I'm like if I was fit to run drinks, I absolutely would want to be on the field. So there's obviously a method in their um, madness there to be able to sort of hold him back to make sure he's ready to go. But him coming back in will definitely provide a bit of a definitely a bit of a spark for their for their team. Um, but England need to turn things around because the signs so far have been not great. There, Chris Wokes, who's normally just so accurate, mm. has been well off the pace. So. That's been a that's been a bit of a surprise, and Sam Curran hasn't been as effective with the ball. So they've got they've definitely got a few. There's a few warning signs there for England, and they they need to turn things around very quickly. But it was being in the box when um, things shifted significantly in that game with Afghanistan, and England. Yeah, that was that was a fun night. <laughs> <laughs> what a, um, can anybody beat India? If so, how? Mm. Do you beat mm. India? I mean, I, I honestly want the the white ball case where you can get at mm. this team. Uh, who do you think can put most pressure on them? Yeah, look, India, the way their team's set up and the way they are playing and all their players being at their absolute best, it does remind me of the Aussie teams like 2003, 2007, through that time where there was no real weak link at all. The, the bad the quality the world class quality just kept coming and coming um and that's how the Indian team is set up right now it they, there is no weakness whatsoever um so look right now the only team I feel that could probably challenge them right now with the form that every team's sort of showing is South Africa 
it's like and South Africa not in knockout stages because we know how that sort of normally ends up. <laughs> but um, the way they're playing right now, South Africa in the sort of group stages, they've been they've been very very good. So they're the only ones who could potentially take down the quality um, Indian Indian bowling attack. They've got penetration with the new ball as well, so they could try and get into India's middle order. But even if you get into India's middle order, you've got Kale Rahul who's batting at five. Um, You've got Hardik Pandya batting batting at six, um, and it's just it it just keeps coming. Mm. So um, and Rohit Sharma's in incredible form. So look, I, it's a great question. I'm not seeing any weakness at the moment. I'm just where where things are at right now. I think India are just going to absolutely dominate this World Cup, and they're going to be the opposition they're going to have to play absolutely out of their skins to come anywhere near close right now just with the with the balance of their team because they've got every base covered mm. spin they've got Jadeja world class spinner Kolib Yadav is bowling incredibly well as well <laughs> so yeah there's no weak link so it's going to be a challenge what, what, what about Watto and his pomp though you know what I mean I'm talking about in third person here Lucky you and your pomp you've got to take down India you're going to be targeting something aren't you you know you're probably not going to tell us because you're too you'd be too humble and, and kind to the Indian I mean would you take down Cool Deep you're taking down Siraj you're walking at him you know I mean how do you, how do you get under their skin because I agree with you it just looks uh, almost like you just I, I, I don't see where you take them down when you're batting like, like do you target Hardik Pandya you know, I mean, they, they all—they're just all excellent and in form, and um, and very luckily being presented um, favourable decks as well at an ICC mm. tournament. <laughs> <laughs> that that definitely helps uh, <laughs> set up your team. Um, look, Boomer Bum, is certainly—he's bowling as as good as I've ever yeah. seen him, and he's bowling well most of the time, and he's mm. certainly at the top of his game. Siraj. He's someone who does. Yes, he bowls bigger taking balls, but he can also leak runs if he gets a little bit if he gets a little bit wrong. My, my take, and this is how I suppose I've always been. I was built anyway. Was fighting fire with fire. You've got to put it back onto the Indian players. You've got to see how they respond when you're actually getting back in their faces, because all opposition are always very careful. Because um, if you cha- if you challenge. Um, the Indian players, things can go, things can get out of control pretty quickly, out of hand pretty quickly. But right now, the way the teams are playing, they're not really fighting fire with fire with India at all. And I think that's where you can really try and ask some questions to see how they're going to respond, is really putting it back with the with the body language. It doesn't need to be the verbal. It doesn't need to be verbal, but just making sure that you're right in the contest yeah, and they know that you're in the, in the battle. Um, and that's where Hardik Pandya... <laughs> He definitely the way he's bowling nicely, but he's someone you could really try and take down and be able to put the pressure on them. Um, but when it's favourable conditions, like we saw in the first game, it's hard to fight fire with fire mm. when the ball's just ripping and turning out of the fresh part of the wicket. Well, I'm sure their luck will run out at some point. Um, <laughs> what I, I want to ask you about, like the um, the feeling when you when you were playing for Australia, because for instance, we've. Just been speaking for what fifteen minutes or so here. Haven't even mentioned New Zealand, and New Zealand have been fantastic, and they are fantastic in every single global tournament, and they'll make the uh, semi-finals, and then you know once you're in that, anything can happen. <clears throat> I would be surprised if you ever, if you playing for Australia ever lost a game against New Zealand. So like we, <laughs> we like you know as Australians, it's our birthright to not you know not rate them. You mentioned before about South Africa. <laughs> you know, South Africa always just fuck it up in the semifinals somehow. India, once they get to a knockout, that's when it really starts to put pressure. And for a lot of people thinking of Australia, they're like, Australia's always there and they always do it. When you were playing, did you guys ever speak about these sort of things or did you ever sort of play on them? Did you ever think about them as, as a player? Like, no, we're Australia. We're going to boss this game. Or like, you know, South Africa will fuck this up. Or whatever. Did you, did you feel that each team had this sort of like characteristic in them absolutely yeah, well that's that's what you're trying to um make the most of and expose mm. for sure because you, you need to make the most of every little angle that you have um to be able to get on top and, and perform in the biggest games um new zealand that's just the mentality of the australia australian team was just was always yes always hear that New Zealand play like above themselves in big games, 
but they've never beat they never mm. beat us in the big games. That mm. was during you know during my career. Sure. Um and and <laughs> India, no question. Um the history over the last you know twenty years in big events, India haven't beaten Australia in the big in the really big events. Um, not consistently anyway, Australia being very dominant. And then you've got um, South Africa, which you know you can sort of open up those wounds pretty mm. quickly because of the the history that South Africa have. So oh, you absolutely need to make the most of those of those um, characteristics of teams because even if the personnel change, a lot of the times the same behaviours and the same sort of um, default behaviours sort of just kick in at yeah. times. And you see that with the Australians as well. When things aren't going right, things can get out of hand pretty quickly because <laughs> the Australians are, are battlers and they're scrappers. So um, the characteristics normally just sort of they come through. But absolutely, you need to open up those those opportunities to be able to really capitalise on teams and countries' weaknesses. Awesome. We're going to win now. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> um do you have any other World Cup questions? I want to ask no. what about his coaching. So, so Watto, um, just Jack Edwards in the Shield and for New South Wales this year, uh, mm. six for 36 in the Shield, nine for the match against Queensland, I think, four for 48 in the Marsh Cup. Uh, he has a 92 and an 87 to his name mm. this year to to go with, a I think, 130 to finish the season last year, pretty lean before that. Uh, he credits that to working with you. Uh Will Sutherland, another all-rounder, big um, pedigree, uh, big things ahead for him. Made 80 and took five for in the last Shield final. He started the season well again. He is Victoria's captain. Credits lots of his improvement to you and your book. Um, what are you saying to these guys, these next-generation Australian all-rounders? Uh, and I have to ask, uh, have you done? can you do that work with Cam Green? um look it's been honestly an absolute privilege to be able to be educated on the information that i have from um, dr jacques delaire um you know i had a chat to will sutherland um last season after he read after he read um, a book winning the inner battle um and he uh he asked a lot of great questions so he really understood the information and and it's had a a bit of an impact anyway on his, he's obviously got incredibly skilled um, for sure um, and just continuing to bring it together like he has. But oh, absolutely for Jack Edwards to be able to sit down um, and work with him over the, in the, um, in the lead up to the season starting um, that, yeah. And then seeing things turn out the way they have at the start of the season, that really just you know, gives me so much joy to know that, um, look, he had put the pieces, started to put the pieces together really nicely for himself in the lead. Like at the end of last year, he, he got 100 in one of the last games. He really started to understand what, how to bring the best that he could and access all the incredible skills that he's got. And then just helping him just understand what the very best version of him is by def- by deeply defining it with him. And then understanding like um, in the book, one of the critical things that I sort of talk about is around understanding what your like sequence of thoughts are in between every ball and then as the ball's about to come out because we very rarely define that we sort of just oh I'll just say watch the ball as the ball comes out but there is a pattern when you're at your best if, like after the ball's bowled and then working through as the ball is going back to his mark and then runs into bowl and just like understanding how to be correctly focused by defining exactly what really every second is like when the bowl is sort of going back to his mark so Jack really, you could understand the questions that he asked. He really, he really got that, um, got that whole concept, and and also by defining the very best version of himself, it's pretty obvious um, that he's a big stature. He knows how to exert himself on the contest as well, and he's certainly been getting up for it. So look, it's it's one of the absolute joys that, and I feel very, very lucky to have had um, the opportunity to be educated on this information and now sort of be the vehicle to trans um, transport this information from Jacques through my experience of using it and now coaching it to be able to help the next generation out. Because in the end, even if it's, it might, I'm confident, I know it's going to help their performance, but the biggest thing that it helps is actually like riding the lows. So you don't, just dip down when you miss out a couple of times because you've got an, a, a real deep awareness of how to be able to just continue to pull yourself back into the right thoughts and the very best version of yourself. And that's that's really, the, I suppose, the, the power in it. This is going to sound like a silly question, surprise, surprise, but I, I think it does have some merit. You just mentioned before um, accessing the best thoughts possible that 
are a little bit more, uh, what's the word, like considered than simply saying watch the ball before someone bowls. Uh, like when, say, before you were educated on this stuff and let's say Shane Watson, um, kind of great across three formats that you are, when you were at your worst, like what did some of those thoughts look like in between balls? Like what's some of the weirdest shit you've thought about in between balls? Cause there's a lot of club cricketers listening to this. who will be like, all I think about is weird shit uh, in oh, between balls. Uh, a lot like, yeah, a lot of not great stuff. Um, like when I wasn't at my best, it was, um, it was always don't get out. I need to score runs today. Yeah. If I don't score runs today, I'm going to get dropped. And then um, other things, obviously, like don't get out LB, God, watch for that ball coming in because that's the only ball that's going to get me out. Mm. Other things would be, oh, if I don't score runs, then oh, um, my lifestyle is going to change if I get dropped. What the hell am I going to do? <laughs> 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 like, a lot of different thoughts yeah. would, would kick in. So, um, wow. and, that's, and that's why just understanding what the right thoughts are for you. Mm. when you're at your absolute best. And it's not until you you sit down and spend some time defining what those right thoughts are for you at your best is then you know whether you correctly focus or not to be able to bring, like, to be the very best that you can. Mm. And when you're thinking about allowing yourself to think about, oh, don't get out or um, don't get, like, um, I need to score runs so I don't get dropped then they are the wrong thoughts and you just mm. got to catch them and, and just redirect it because you are in control of your thoughts. So you need to exercise that control that you do have. But, oh, yeah, there's – I'm sure I'm every, – well, I know every cricketer, <laughs> you have some very weird thoughts as you're out there when you know you need to perform. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, Wado, thank you for talking through that. If you are watching on YouTube, we've just actually turned the lights out because we're kissing listening to uh, Wado talk. <laughs> um, it's not a tech issue at all. If you're listening on the podcast, don't worry about what we just said. Um <laughs> Watto, thanks so much for joining us and for all those insights. As per, you can get winning the inner battle. Uh, it's actually just it's going hot off the shelves, and then and then you're writing a new version, right? That's going to go to Australia and India. The big players are reading it. Everyone's reading it. Um, and also just for your World Cup thoughts as well, Watto. Really appreciate them, mate. We'll catch you around. Appreciate it. Great to chat as always, boys. Thanks very much to Watto for giving us the time. We always have to say these things because this is uh, we haven't spoken to him yet. Yeah, so you know, sound amazing if you things, can't make it. Things can happen. Things can happen. Um, let's talk about uh, Australian domestic cricket pairs before we get into the Australian women uh, ODIs against the West Indies and okay. the WBBL. So the Sheffield Shield season has been going on. Uh, one thing I found interesting is that um, Usman Khawaja has not played for Queensland this game against Victoria, which is in Mackay, uh, under Cricket Australia's workload management, which now includes batters. I just found that really interesting just in relation to the ODI team that's currently there and the amount of guys that um, would surely be getting rested as well uh, and the fatigue, that they, the fatigue yeah. that they must be experiencing given that Kawaja, who obviously played in the Border Gavaska series um, in February in India, then he obviously played in the World Test Championship and then the Ashes straight away. But apart from that, I don't think he's played any other mm. cricket. So he's actually being rested. Ahead I think of he's the, played a couple for Queensland. He would have yeah. played for Queensland, yes. Yeah. So, um, but then he's obviously got the Australian summer coming up, and then uh, New Zealand, then New Zealand, and then after that, I don't think the Test team actually plays again until the next summer, which is against India, because after after the Australian team goes to New Zealand for two Tests, so Quaj is only going to play those two Tests. Then the IPL starts basically straight away after that. Then a week after that, the T Twenty World Cup starts in the West Indies and the USA. And then that's August. And I don't think Australia have a – in fact, they, they don't. They don't have a, a winter tour next mm. year. So the fact that he's being rested is quite amazing given that – or how many other guys would have played more? Cam Green, Cummins, Stark, mm. Hazelwood, Warner, well, it's a concession Smith, from t- Marnus. Yeah, it's a concession from Cricket Australia Travis that said, the guys are tired. Mitch Marsh. Mm. They've, yeah, they'd have to be absolutely exhausted. Anyway, Kawhi's just not playing. Uh, in that game, though, Matt Renshaw scored 135 against Victoria. Uh, Michael Nisa also hit 90 uh, for Queensland. Matt Shaw hit 100 in the first innings. Uh, there's been there's been a lot of talk, I suppose, because Warner's going to retire at the end of the summer if he is selected, although it feels like he is, given he's on the promos uh, for the summer coming up. So it feels like Warner's probably going to play uh, in the Pakistan series anyway. Uh, so there's the, the conversations now about who's going to replace him. Marcus Harris feels like the front runner. Uh, then there's obviously Matt Renshaw, who has been in the squad recently. He was in the Ashes squad, though he didn't play. Um, he did play in India, though, didn't he? Renshaw played in India. Yeah, and before they got dropped and then Travis Head came in to – because, yeah, Head was dropped. They played Renshaw after one game and they 
switched it back. Where is it? Where are you saying? Oh, Renshaw play. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, in India. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, there's obviously Cameron Bancroft who scored 100 for WA in the I think in the first game. Um, so there's all these guys who were putting their hand up, I suppose, to replace him. But uh, that's what's going on in Shield cricket. Jordan Silk scored 100 for Tasmania in Perth, obviously against Western Australia. Uh, apparently, he was on 99 for 21 balls. Uh, I was watching the highlights of that, and uh, wouldn't say there was that many in his half uh, while he was on 99. But uh, he did score 100 for Tasmania in that game. Uh, anything else you're seeing in? Uh, in Sheffield Shield? No, yeah. Unfortunately, the, the guy with the megaphone hasn't turned up. Uh, <laughs> the, from last the, week. <coughs> the gold-plated dildo. Um, yeah. No, nah, I, I suppose bad off stuff, isn't it? Yeah, Bancroft has a ton. Renshaw has a ton. Um, bit of people talking up Caleb Jewell. Yes. Uh, and now uh, I guess Michael Neeson might replace David Warner because he's the most informed bat in Australia. It's <laughs> Unbelievable. Three, for the last three years, which yeah. is awesome. Uh, WA is unbeatable uh, in the... In the old Mercantile Mutual, I'm just going to call it that. Yep. Jack Nisbet, debuting for New South Wales, got hit for six first ball, then got Ben McDermott out and gave him a fucking massive oh, yeah, send-off. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Fucking yeah, yeah. enormous send-off. <laughs> yeah. I'm here for it. Yep. I'm here for that shit. Uh, but, yeah, um, it, it, it plows on in earnest. Mm. I saw uh, Henry Hunt leave a ball from Moses, hit leg stump. Yeah, that's right. That was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, New South Wales getting pumped there last time I saw. New South Wales giving South Australia a sniff. Yep. Mm. Yep. Good stuff. Uh, all right. Let's talk about the uh, let's talk about the women though, uh, because the Australian women have won their ODI series against the West Indies two nil. The first ODI they chase eighty three safety. The second ODI, which was in Melbourne, there was washed out with the West Indies eight for one hundred and seven, and then the third ODI also at the Junction Oval, uh, of course in Melbourne here chase they chased one hundred and three. So they bowled them out for eighty three, had them eight for one hundred and seven, and also one hundred and three. So pretty good bowling performance all around. Uh, Hayley Matthews, I think, only might have played the last game, the last ODI, or the, maybe the second and the third ODI. Anyway, she's obviously been fantastic. She I mean, she had this unbelievable T20 series uh, for the West Indies, scoring over 300 runs and taking five or six wickets as well in a three-match series. Incredible. Anyway, she, she was. Uh, she said afterwards that she was frustrated with some umpiring decisions, one of which was a caught and bowl by Annabelle Sutherland. Did you see this? Yeah. Uh, which appeared to hit the ground. That was off Stephanie Taylor. Um, it's actually amazing how how often this stuff happens where it feels like there's general consensus after it's happened that it's like, well, that wasn't out. You know what I mean? There was two, there was two calls like that in that game. Yeah. yeah. Stefani Taylor hits that one back to Annabelle Sutherland. It's a great, it's a great um, I suppose, r- receiving of the ball from Sutherland, mm. whether you want to say it's a catch or not. Yeah. Uh, it's it's sensational it's piece of yeah. – Yeah, sensational yeah. piece of uh, fielding off her own bowling. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is funny how it's like – yeah, I suppose – I don't know that it doesn't. It's given not out. Maybe the West Indies get away. It, it, you tend to give it less credence when the team is just getting walloped. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, oh, Maybe yeah. it wouldn't have made much of a difference. But I suppose yeah. that's that's a bit of a shallow analysis. It did a lot of balls seem to be hitting a lot of ground with that. And there was another LBW decision. I cannot remember the batter's name at the time from Alana King, where it looked it, they had a lot like a big look at it. But I felt like there was a peak inside edge that just. Didn't that got, that got overlooked or yeah. w- was decided that it wasn't? Yeah. But um, actually, made I, I, I some uh, editorial. I mm-hmm. took the family out to that third game at Junction. Yeah, Oval, yeah, yeah. Uh, with the support of my wife, she she came as well. Both boys uh, came. It was not a great day for watching cricket. Like it was cold, wasn't it? cold yeah. uh, at Junction, but very um, like really beautiful day or beautiful thing to do with families. Good set up there at Junction Oval, yep. um, and uh, and yeah, and it was it was pretty awesome. That um, Pez actually, uh, Elise Perry said good day to my boys as well, who were quite starstruck. Uh, but that, that was <laughs> nice. So it made my day. Um, yeah. They're three and five. I don't think they gave a fuck. Yeah. But um, um, it was really just about me. Um, yeah, of course. But um, that was really nice. Uh, and uh, and then yeah, also noticed at Junction in the first game, he goes they. Um, they were struggling with with weather all day, so uh, not to be confused with Jake Weatherald. Yes. And um, there was really good pictures of the women's team doing the covers. Yeah, did yeah, you, I saw did that. They were yeah. doing the covers, yeah, and yeah. Uh, like um, a commentator pointed out how late Scott Pet Presswidge and Dan Marsh, who are in the Australian team, were mm. in coming out. So the entire women's team, That's like experience. it's blustery day, yes. just got every like their hands yeah. all over the covers, like working as a team, yes, um, with hu- with humility, <laughs> right. grace, right. Uh, and a, and a bid to continue the cricket that's being played yeah. that everybody's watching for the you know the uh, the nation's entertainment, right? Uh, 
and then Dan Marsh and Scott Presswich just, yeah, just sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we'll uh, do the Hessian. I saw, uh, yeah, he- Healy, uh, Elisa Healy's playing 130i. You, right. could, you could hear her, you could hear her mic'd up. She was saying, men, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm also thinking, you know, and then everyone's like, you know, waxing lyrical, and this is correct, you know. Aren't they such a likable team? You yeah. know, they they win and they do these things. And I'm also like, well, hang on a second. I mean, if if if, if any club cricketer uh, or any cricketer, you know, mm. international all levels, has the opposition eight for 107, yeah, it's fucking fill your boots time. Yes. get those fucking covers on. Yeah, you reckon you reckon the the women's team are all over the covers if the windies are eight for three fifty <laughs> and Haley Matthews having a party. I mean, there's a pragmatic part of this as well. Give them their due. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, a bit on the nose. Uh, another thing, just with um, just wanted to say this to you specifically. Um, mm-hmm. In the the game at the junction, um, there was a 1973 women's team reunion. Uh, so that was the first ever World Cup that was played two years before the men, 50th anniversary, all 11 surviving players there. Awesome um, reunion for those guys. When they played in 1973, mm-hmm. uh, they paid their own way to the UK. Uh, they went to Downing Street. They met Margaret Thatcher, 14 players, a manager, no coach, no nothing. Great names there like Patsy Fain, um, who was the first Australian woman he goes to take a wicket at Lords, mm-hmm. but she was barred from the pavilion. Um, Mark Jennings and also Sharon Treadray. Right. Um, so yeah. good, good to see them get together. Yeah. Uh, and I'm Couple reminded of all famous of, there. I, I, I'm reminded of Sharon Treadray's excellent speech at the Cricket Australia Awards. Yes. Yeah. Um, Having had some experience in the West Indies, of course. Who were well, they all there. had fun when yeah. they went away, didn't that's they? Right, that's, that's right. That's what we learn about that's in that right. speech: the fun that they had on tour yes. and the people they encountered. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> One day we'll tell that story, <laughs> or maybe not. Uh, congratulations to those women, obviously, and they are greats of the game. Just one of the all-time speeches. Quick <laughs> 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 Australia Awards. <laughs> Can't keep talking about that. Um, the WBBL, that starts on Thursday, October 19. We're talking Thursday. What's today? Tuesday? Yeah, Thursday. Yeah, two days yeah, time yeah, Thursday. Yeah, That's yeah. right. Hey, we've got, we got a big interview next week with a couple of uh, those players as well. Yes. Um, as I said last week, the Australian women are next in action um, – for, for the national side at the end of January against South Africa. It's three T20s, three ODIs, and then a test match, which is going to be at the Wacker. The, the Wacker test match is mid-February. Um, but just talking about the WBBL, so Elise Perry is out of the first game due to a slow overrate in the final against the Strikers last season. I'm not sure if you saw this, but um, no. both the Sydney Sixers and Channel 7, obviously the, the broadcaster, had asked the band to be lifted. Yeah. <laughs> but, but apparently no dice. Um, the, the head of the Big Bash was like, nah, it's just the rules and like just broke the rules and she's got a ban. And it's, it's, come on. It's, it's Pez. But, but the Sixers and Channel 7 are like, ah, come, come on. on. Come on. It's Pezza. Get him out there. Um, Sophie Molyneux has been ruled out of the entire WBBL, oh, unfortunately, for the Renegade. She's recovered covering from an ACL, which we did, which she did for um, playing domestic cricket. She's going to miss the entire WBBL, which goes for 57 games, by the way, the WBBL. I'm not sure if you, if you haven't heard, uh, maybe it might have been Ash Garden, I think it might have been, um, who was even talking about, look, it's what the WBBL has done for women's cricket generally, and it is a premier tournament. I know the WPL has started, the the women's uh, Indian Premier League, the WPL, Um which was had a great year last year, but what the WBBL has done over the last few years is, is the is the premier of domestic cricket or the the premier competition of domestic cricket, um, and we're so lucky to have it in Australia. But fifty seven games, it's too many games. Like that's it's so many games. That's, that's what the players have been saying. Uh, anyway, so Sophie Molyneux is out of the entire WBBL, but she will return. Uh, I guess she plays for Victoria, right? Um, for the domestic season. Uh, later this summer. So she was captain of the Renegades. Harmanpreet Kaur, captain of India, and Hayley Williams, captain of the West Indies, they both play for the Renegades. So there's a chance there that um, that either one of those two will captain uh, the Renegades side. But apparently also Georgia Wareham, uh, Australia's own Georgia Wareham, is in the hunt for that captaincy gig as well. But I would have thought Harmanpreet Kaur or Hayley Williams would have got the nod ahead of that. So um, anyway, the WBBL starts on... Thursday, which means that the cricket is here very much in Australia. Maybe mm. the women have obviously been playing, but, you know, when I'm looking at the Junk Chernobyl and it's blowing a gale and people wearing scarves, uh, it's like it doesn't quite feel like cricket season just yet. Mm. Uh, but it is here now. So it starts on Thursday. Um, should we talk to Gideon Hay now, oh, who's going to come into studio? Fuck. 
Value. Uh, once again, this hasn't happened, so hopefully, hopefully he makes it. Um, <laughs> what is? I don't think what that means. It's got a hit out on him. Um, uh, and we're going to have a, uh, a broader ranging conversation, I suppose, about cricket generally. So nice to have uh, – not nice. It's a fucking pleasure to have Gideon A in the studio here. So here he is right now. Hopefully, here's Gideon. Well, we've got cricket's greatest writer with us uh, in studio. It's always an honour, a privilege. You want to get your words right. Um, Gideon Haig, welcome to TJC Towers. Yeah, I'm sort of a cricket writer who's not writing at the moment. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I'm so that's like why I got you in, really. Ship. Yeah. Mm. Well, before, before you get into that question, like the question being like, why the fuck haven't I read your writing for a little while? Um, <laughs> got to, we've got to start at the roots, like the grassroots. You're, you're, you're still a player. Like you, you play cricket. Yeah. Um, like how are you hitting them? How are they coming out? Uh, you know how you're feeling ahead of the season. Worst yeah. questions. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm I'm on the brink of my 350th game at the Arrows, but I've this will this weekend will be my fourth attempt to play it because I've had three washouts in a row. Uh, it's beginning to feel like I'm just destined never to get there. Yeah. The weather doesn't look too bad, but uh, yeah, it's been a bit dodgy. The weather uh, early season in Melbourne. Pretty standard mm. Melbourne conditions. We got close last weekend, but uh, they called it off at the last minute. So I won't really know until I get out there. Mm. Uh, we got indoor nets tonight, but I said I've, I've done enough indoor nets. Yeah, had I'll, enough. I'll, I'll yeah. Hopefully I'll go down and have a hit on turf on Thursday. At yeah, the junction there, they actually like they put the speed gun up as well, which is not really um, ideal as no, a club cricketer. No, no. Uh, mm. you're always you used to think, oh, yeah, I'll, pr- I'll probably nibble them around at 120s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, No, um, you don't. No, you don't, actually. <laughs> and if you go there year after year, you can see how much your speed's dropped off since last <laughs> season. <laughs> it's always five kilometres slower. Yeah. And you're trying your hardest, and it's just coming out with all the force of a meringue mm. and barely get into the other end. And you're trying to try to feign that it's not uh, – it wasn't the effort ball. Actually, they're all effort balls. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you, you alluded to this earlier. I mean, uh, cards on the table for me. Uh, I think I've said it before, but your podcast with Pete, uh, Cricket Etc., is uh, like an absolute go-to listen for me. I think both of you are, you know, the two senior most uh, cricket narrators in Australia – uh, and would be in the conversation that we often have yeah. as people who haven't had sex in six months um, yeah. around the world. So, um, but, but I haven't heard the podcast for You're a while. Married. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not going to bring my marriage into it. I, I wouldn't, be the, I wouldn't be the first married man who can say that statistic, another stat dog. Um, yeah. But um, that aside, uh, yeah, haven't, haven't read you for a little while and the pod uh, had a very abrupt... Um, Conclusion. Sign off, Sign yeah. off a couple of weeks yeah. ago. Yeah. Well, look, I I, uh, I recently finished as uh, cricket columnist at the Australian after twelve years there. I had a good time. I enjoyed um, my working relationships. Got some great opportunities. Uh, struck up a great rapport with Pete Lawler, which was reflected in our in our podcast. But uh, I sort of decided over the last year that um, I never meant to be cricket journalist. I always meant to be a journalist who wrote about cricket. So this is a very accidental career. And you know, I'm getting to the age where I want the opportunity to do other things. It was pretty clear to me that I wouldn't get the opportunity to do other things at The Australian. I was pretty well typecast there as their cricket columnist. Um, I explored that option, but it wasn't really on the table. So I thought, I'm going to have to take matters into my own hands and, and make a clean break. So I decided to do that. Uh, it, uh, the Oz seemed pretty happy for me to go. Uh, I actually had my last day last week. Didn't hear anything from them. When you leave the Australian, it's a little bit like you're sort of unpersoned. Uh, you, uh, you cease to exist. Your name is mentioned, never mentioned there again. That's fine. Uh, I'm not particularly sentimental about these things either. But I had wanted to continue doing the podcast with Pete independently. Uh, The Oz have said, well, they haven't said it to me, they haven't said anything to me, but they have said to Pete no, uh, despite the fact that he works 
Uh, yeah, I see extra, Pete in lots of other places. Well, he's extra. He works extramurally at um, at Channel Seven and uh, and SEN, but uh, it's um, offsiders. Offsiders, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're sort of in limbo at the moment. Uh, I'm not quite sure how much extra I should say, but mm. it's uh, media organisations, large media organisations are. Uh, pretty bureaucratic, they're pretty sclerotic, uh, they don't rush to make decisions if they don't absolutely have to, so uh, so you just have to move it to their glacial pace. And she's not glacial because glaciers move quite quickly these days, but, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> we, we, um, we're Australian. just biding our time. <laughs> I, I would like to continue the pod, but I'm not interested in doing it under the auspices of the Australian, mm. which I'll would defeat the purpose of my leaving. Okay, mm. yeah that that particular explanation didn't uh, wasn't forthcoming in your sign off show. It seemed to well, cut actually, from one. Well, <laughs> actually, it, it, it was <laughs> right. until it uh, yeah. until it disappeared in the edit. Oh right, yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh, so you, you did explain it to your audience. I think. Well, we explained it to our producer, but, uh, <laughs> but, it, uh, but it didn't get out any further. I think uh, Sam, you actually noticed that yeah. uh, there was a strange disjunction, like those yeah. like that uh, that missing half an hour in uh, in Nixon's tapes. <laughs> I think you'd actually said it, when you do podcasts for a long time, and we've, we're no strangers to uh, very cold, hard, bad edits. Yeah. And uh, I, I was listening intently as to um, what was what would come next, because there would be a lot of people who probably subscribe to the Australian solely to read you uh, and and Pete as well. Yeah. And um, I mean, I know people like that. I've been one. Mm. Uh, and when I was listening to your sign off, I think you'd said something like, "Oh, I'm leaving of my own volition," and you're in a particular tone. I'm leaving of yeah. my own volition, and the next thing you were saying, "We've done 350 episodes." It was very strange. <laughs> guys. Uh, the uh, shepherd's chat. crook yeah. comes yeah. Right. Yeah. the stage. It was when they put the record scratch in, which I thought was the weirdest part. <laughs> but that's just that's just an edit. That's just yeah. an edit issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. and Look. and so you and so. <laughs> the, sorry, you're going to say something. Else I know. I would say that um, you know the. Uh, the, the people who run the Australian are, are I think, um, very technically proficient, um, work extremely hard to the point of being mortally overstretched, and they're terrible managers of people, just absolutely woeful. So uh, that's probably about as far as I can go mm. on the front. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm not really going to like probe you further. I, right. I think you've said enough, mm. uh, and I definitely won't be sending this to the news producers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, that's interesting. And and uh, you being you, you aren't just a cricket writer. Uh, what else are you going to do? Are we going to be able to read your cricket uh, this summer? It's, that might still be up in the air as well. Uh, yeah, that's up in the air. Uh, I do have a long-term book project that I've just started work on, um, which is non-cricket related, uh, but one I'm enjoying doing very much. Uh, that'll take me right away from this this realm. Um, I've just written a, uh, just published a, self-published a book, which you can see on yeah. the table in front of us. It's a um, very good, uh, Sam. Very good. Very good, Sam. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, He's it's, waving a pendulum yeah. in front of me. You can't see that at the moment. I, uh, I have my own little imprint. The girl in uh, Cabin 350. Yeah. I have my own little imprint called the Archives Liberation Front where I like to take a factual story that I'm interested in from the past and use public records or the, the, the skills of journalism to, uh, to turn it into a, uh, into a book. That was a story I got, I got interested in last year. It's a it's a niche book. It was probably too small a subject to interest a mainstream publisher. Right. But I just thought I'd uh, it, when I'm curious about something, I tend to go. The only way that I'm going to find out more about this is if I write a book. So I did, and there's now it's normal twelve boxes of it sitting yeah. in my kitchen waiting <laughs> to be sold. So if you're interested, yeah. uh, you just contact me through my website. Oh, very nice. It relates to a, a young woman, a, a 19-year-old nurse called Gwenda McCallum, who disappeared on a, uh, on a journey on the Orcades, an ocean liner, travelling between Sydney and Melbourne in 1949. It was one of those sort of media stories that flashes around the world, uh, fascinating mystery. You know, the cabin's open, she's gone. Where's she gone? Uh, the mystery's never been resolved. I thought probably can't really resolve that mystery, but it'd be interesting to see what the consequences of it were and what the circumstances of it were leading up to the to the incident. 
you're always interested when you do these books to see how to find out. Um, it, the, part of the journey is finding out how to write the book as well as writing the book. Uh, you, know, you shoot an arrow into the air and it falls to earth you know mm. not where. But it's absolutely fascinating what still exists and the people that are out there, if you can actually find them. Uh, I had many fascinating adventures uh, on the way and I've put together what I think is quite a satisfactory retelling. Disappearances have always quite interested me as a, as a genre. Uh, they're different to murders, for instance. They're different to kidnappings or, or other crimes uh, because they're fundamentally unresolvable. They leave, they leave a, a narrative trail that you kind of have to fill in with your own imagination mm. if you're a survivor. So it was fascinating to get to know the family and to discover what had become of them as a result of trying to make up stories about, about what had yeah, happened. Yeah, wow. Every sort of member of the family had a different aspect of the story. They didn't actually talk to each other, so they'd never really reconciled it um, in their own minds. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Like all these books are jigsaw puzzles. Mm. Um, and I'll probably continue to do little books like that. They're kind of creatively fascinating, and because I'm a bit of a control freak, I like the fact that I have complete mastery of every aspect of it down to the, to the, uh, to the finer points of, of design. I think it's a very beautiful book. Uh, it's on beautiful paper. It's got a lovely cover. It's got copious illustration. I think it's pretty well written. It's uh, copy edited by my mum, so it'd be ex an exemplary job there. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so let me know if you're interested in a copy. For sure. Uh, speaking of mastery, does India have mastery of this World Cup? <laughs> <laughs> and world That's a cricket and central <laughs> quality segue. <laughs> and, world, and world cricket itself. <laughs> yeah, look, they're pretty damn good, aren't they? They mm. are really good. The strange thing about India these days is they could probably put into the arena three international quality teams and they'd have the, the beating of most sides, particularly in their, in their own conditions. Mm. Uh, they were hugely impressive against Pakistan. I might say, you know, I, because I'm not writing on this cup, I'm not watching it as, uh, in as uh, dedicated a fashion as I, as I normally would. I'm picking and choosing the games that I see and the players that I want to watch. But India is compulsively watchable, aren't mm. they? Uh, and there's just so much quality to squeeze into their sides. In some ways, the biggest challenge that they face is selection, finding their their optimum lineup according to conditions. Mm. Mm. Um, how would you rate the World Cup so far? I mean, you've mentioned that you're not particularly uh, dedicated to watching every game, so that probably means you're like most normal people yeah. now, yeah. Which, is, yeah. which, yeah. which is which is which is more in line with everyone who listens to the show. Mm. Hopefully, not normal fellas in this show, but um, <laughs> how how would you rate it as a spectacle? What what are you seeing in terms of um, the, the different layers and components of it? It's difficult from a distance, isn't it? Because we see what's a very superficial glance at the cup and in fact it's spread all over India you know, where is the center of the cup there's no obvious mm. central location uh, it's it's a bit fragmented um, at least it, it, the virtue of this cup is that everyone plays everyone else uh, so it's not like you have to accompany a, a or, or acclimatize to different group stages or uh, or it's, it's not complex it's a it's a 1992 standard cup in a way uh, it has all the vices of, of any sporting event that's spread over six weeks in that uh, it's very difficult to maintain a uniform level of excitement about, uh, about games. It probably won't get really intense until the last couple of weeks. Uh, there is a sense that, we, that we're watching a format pass before our eyes. Uh, I think it's confusing to have to go back to 50 over cricket after a diet of, of non-stop T20 for, for so many years. That adds a layer of interest because we are actually in some cases seeing players who have teethed themselves in T20 trying to educate themselves up to 50 over level. And it's actually, it's harder to hide in 50 over cricket. Uh, if you only bowl four overs or, or three or four overs in T20, it's pretty difficult to stretch yourself to bowling a 10 over spell. It's a completely different discipline. So, yeah, look, uh, 
I'll keep on watching him in a, probably a, a pretty desultory fashion for, uh, for for the next few few weeks. Uh, I'm enjoying watching South Africa. I enjoyed watching the Australia South Africa series. Uh, Australia's kind of struggling to get back into it, as you were saying off air, Higo. It's you know, we we sort of needed Australia to, mm. to to get over the line last night, so that we we continued to have a sort of a, a presence at, uh, at at high table. But there is a sense that it hasn't quite come together for Australia so far. It's, it, it seems strange to have gone into a World Cup not being sure of our best 11. Yeah. What were, what were all those 50-over games leading into the World Cup about if it wasn't at arriving that? But in fact, it seemed to end up with more questions than it mm. did answers. Mm. Mm. I wonder, uh, Pez and I were thinking uh, or hypothesising, I suppose, the other day about our uh, our being Australia's interest in the World Cup, this World Cup in particular. Mm. Because if Australia were red hot, I mean, yeah. they were only number one in the world five minutes ago, yeah. but... If they'd come in the great run of form, they'd won one of the first two games or, or at least challenged India in the first game. Mm. If we'd be more invested as a as a country in the tournament, because like because I think all the things you mentioned before about the the backdrop of this sort of like a hyper nationalist movement of India, generally yeah. speaking, um, there's there's other issues about you know like Durham Shala, for instance, the outfield's yep. just a complete disgrace, yep. which isn't their fault. It's just a, that's a weather issue more than anything else. But um, but uh, you know, if Australia were like were purring, would 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 Australians be up all night watching the cricket? You know, would be really be invested in in the fifty over World Cup? I I, I don't know. It's a difficult time of year, isn't it? Yeah. Really after the footy finals, uh, I think we have always struggled to get into cricket coming into the season. So yeah. leading off with the World Cup, which will be the biggest event that we have for the next year, is a is a challenge for for Australian sporting uh, followers. I think there's still yeah, we. I think we can also we've we've got a limited degree of bandwidth over the course of a year for watching cricket. When you've had the Indian tour and you've had the Ashes as well, that is a lot of cricket yeah. already. Yeah. Uh, I think people really did get into the Ashes. Uh, I mean, I was in England throughout, but I but I got the sense that Australia was watching it very closely. Yeah, same. Yeah. And when things exploded at Lords, that added a, a level of um, of. Uh, of acrimony, mm-hmm. uh, satisfying acrimony, mm-hmm. stimulating acrimony. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, business model. <laughs> and, I, and I think that that's probably reflected in our numbers at the Yarras. We all, you yeah. always come off the end of an Ashes series. Plenty of guys want to play cricket at yeah. the start of the season. Interesting, yeah. But the general fan who doesn't play cricket uh, probably feels like a bit of a break. Yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, do you think the general fan is going to get a break this whole summer in Australia, uh, given what's being offered up? And do you think that we're going to have more summers like that, like that we've got down, um, coming up as time goes on, given that there are fewer teams playing Test cricket and, and perhaps the summer as we know it is going to change complexion entirely? Well, let's just say that you know. The summer, I feel altogether sorry about missing. <laughs> uh, uh, I think I would struggle to get up for it. Uh, it's certainly looking like a very good summer to play cricket rather than to watch mm. it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's good for the players. Yeah. I, I, I do wonder if our um, if Australia's cricketing summer will look different in ten years' time or so. Mm. I mean, just judging from the movements of the game, uh, the um, that there's more and more T20 competitions that seem to be mm. uh, overseas butting up against what yep. we would consider, you know, quote unquote, our yep. summer. Yep. That there are fewer teams uh, able to send out competitive test sides, which is usually the the basis of our mm. summer. That there's a um, seems to be a growing conversation about the uh, aims and ambitions of um, a Indian domestic franchise driven cricket investing private equity into other mm. competitions, whether that might find its way to the 100 or whatever England does with its T20 comp and whether it might find its way to the BBL. You know, do, do you see a scenario where, as doomsday as it might seem to the Australian public, where it has to reconfigure um, what, hmm. what our priorities are yeah. in cricket, given that Test cricket does seem to be mm. um, played by fewer countries and that most of the money seems to be coming for fran- domestic franchise cricket. Yeah, well, the strange thing about domestic franchise cricket is that it still relies on the establishment game or the uh, the established game 
for its cricketers. You know, its relationship is fundamentally still parasitic. Uh, the question would be whether you know, first-class cricket becomes simply a feeder for, uh, for um, franchise competitions. Because I don't see the franchise competitions making any attempt to create talent. They're prepared to buy talent, they're prepared to bid talent and bid talent up, but where's that talent going to, to come from? There does actually need to be a degree of reinvestment in the pathways that, that, that lead to elite cricket. Uh, so there are just so many questions left unresolved by the kind of scenario that you're, that you're talking about that we don't really seem to even want to discuss. Yeah, We can kind of see <clears> the, <throat> the end, but we can't see the, the, the steps along the way that are in, inherent in that end. I wonder whether uh, state teams will end up becoming farms for uh, yeah, yeah. for domestic, uh, yeah. like like for for IPL or IPL adjacent mm. contracts. Uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. I I I just get the impression that the cricket world is going in one direction. Yeah, um, and that Australia summer is something that we all bury our heads in the sand with and, yes. and expect to be delivered to us each yeah. each year. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, you could argue that that's happened to some degree already in India. You know, only a relatively small proportion of Indian players play in the IPL. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and there's a huge first-class scene over there. And the first-class players are actually very, very poorly looked after mm. by the BCCI. Uh, they exist in the hope of a kind of a lightning strike at the, at the IPL auction, which will lift them out of the... Uh, out of the ruck of the uh, of, of the everyday, it's a, it's a pretty feudal system that uh, that India has created. It's a weird sort of melange of semi amateurism mm. and hyper professionalism. Uh, I'd hate that to happen in Australia, but it's certainly a scenario that that it's possible to envision. Mm. Are you are you optimistic, Gids, about um, cricket generally speaking in our in our summers in in Australia? I mean, because I to black hat things, I see our best players playing their highest standard of cricket in the IPL, which is like a fantastic league that Pez and I are very fortunate enough to watch because yep. it is our job to watch. The games start at midnight and they finish at 3, 4 a.m. Mm. here. It's, it's the most unwatchable time for most mm. Australians. And also it's in April or April, May uh, when footy season's on yeah. and, and people aren't playing cricket here. Yeah. <clears throat> are we to wait for the great test series of India and England um, for – for those teams to come out to Australia, even though, as I say, England, who who gave us a great series in 2011, well, in fact, it wasn't even a good series, they smashed us in 2011, yeah, yeah. 12. 10, 11. 10, 11. Yep, 10, 10, 11. 10, 11. Yeah. Apart from that, in my lifetime even, I'm 37, hasn't really been that good. So the Ashes in Australia isn't even that good. India yeah. the last couple of times has been great. Anyway, my point being as well, then I look at short form cricket and like, do the best players come out and play our Big Bash? And I saw last year Faf Duplessis play three and a half games and then he left to go to either the SA20 or the, um, the yeah, one of the UAE. Yeah. So there's so much to be negative about, but I just I feel like am I going to see the best players play in my summer, in my time zones forever? Because it doesn't really feel like it. Well, yeah, we're glutted with cricket now, aren't we? It's just on so television much to we are yes from. yes yeah. uh, you turn on your television every night and there's always cricket from somewhere right so so it, the um, we're kind of surfeited with with cricket and uh, you know appetite doesn't actually grow with the eating where um, yeah. where cricket's concerned mm. uh, after a while your palate becomes pretty pretty jaded mm. uh, and there's, there's to, to these competitions there's never any sort of provenance you don't quite know where they fit yeah. in the overall scheme of things there's just someone out there who's Hitting sixes somewhere <laughs> yeah, in the world, yeah. yeah. And the ground sort of look a bit the same. Trying desperately, yeah. to sound excited about it. So, <laughs> da- Danny Morrison's yeah. excited yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it used to be Chris Gale, you know, yeah. spitting out sixes like a like a Pez dispenser. But, uh, but it's someone else now, I dare say. Um, yeah. Periodically, I'll tune into a game and I will actually think, oh, this is actually quite interesting. Oh, the competition's over. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't really make any sense. Um, there's no. There's no sort of general agreement about what is the top anymore. Mm. It used to be a generally accepted uh, hierarchy, didn't didn't there? Uh, you knew when to tune in and when to tune out. But you're now 
you're now expected to be perpetually tuned in and not everyone can be, mm. frankly. Mm. Uh, look, it's good for the players and you know it, it, it keeps the days apart, but one day blends pretty much into another. There's no sort of sense of rise and fall. There's no real sense, of, I think, of expectation about this summer. I think people are a bit resigned to, uh, to, to what is going to be on offer. It's the kind of summer where the BBL, I think, was meant to earn its corn. Mm. You know, in the in the in the quiet international summers, it was always meant to be the BBL that was going to yes. provide us with the with the thrills and spills, and that I guess that's worked in some limited degree. Shouldn't leave out women's cricket either. Actually, I find myself watching almost as much women's cricket as I do men's cricket these days. Because it actually it seems a little bit more significant. Mm. Actually, it, it it creates perhaps more lasting impressions. But yeah, look, it's um, it's pretty hard if you've got a memory of cricket that was different. It's actually pretty hard to acclimatise yourself to uh, to what's on offer now. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know if you saw Gideon, but it, it's been confirmed that cricket will be at the Olympics. T uh, Twenty cricket will be at the LA Olympics in twenty twenty eight. Eight, yep. Um, men's and women's. Mm. Uh, there'll be six teams in each comp, uh, and I suppose the USA would be one. Uh, India will be another. Uh, d- does does it interest you one iota? No. <laughs> in a word, I've I've never been exercised by the idea of cricket at the Olympics. I always thought the Olympics needs cricket more than cricket needs the Olympics. Mm. Uh, I have. D- Deep reservations about the IOC as a, as an organisation. <laughs> the idea of the IOC and the ICC—it's <laughs> like you know all your nightmares cube, uh, <laughs> as far as administration's concerned. Uh, look, I'll worry about it when it when it comes around, and I'll mm. decide then whether I'm excited about it. I guess the potential upside is that it does reflate the value of international cricket. You know, if you're not playing. For your country at that stage, you won't be in the um, in in the running for uh, for that. But of course, it's it's T Twenty as well. It's not cricket. It's it's T Twenty that they're going to be playing. Uh, it's a question of how meaningful that can possibly be. Mm. If Australia wins gold, it'll mean everything. Don't you want to be shit? But don't, as an Australian, May from yeah. the don't you want to be showered in yeah. gold in yeah. you know Howard era Australian sporting nasty sporting sporting superiority? Yeah. You I've know, sort of, I've always sort of gone to ground about Olympics time. I don't think I, <laughs> I, don't think I even watched. The, I didn't watch the two thousand Olympics all that closely. What the fuck? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We actually had a club function the night of the opening ceremony for the. Uh, for the Olympics in 2000, I hadn't realised that it was actually the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> I think half a dozen oh, blokes man. came to the pub. Yeah. Do, you reckon, do you reckon the players are looking at that being like, oh, Olympics? Because I reckon most of them will be like, ah, oh, when is it? Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm usually on holidays yeah, in Greece yeah, somewhere, yeah, usually. Yeah, I might take a break there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, don't want to burn out. No, exactly. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, Major League Cricket starts after that. Just, uh, nah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gideon, do you have any advice to uh, up and coming cricket uh, narrators or storytellers who um, who um, receive uh, hundreds of threats a day <laughs> at the um, at the mention of um, the BCCI or any um, anything that might resemble a critique of it mm. uh, in and its relationship to the game? Um, oh, bring it on! <laughs> bring on the threats! Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can't exercise your freedom. Of, of expression, and what's the point of having it in the first place? Uh, look, it's yeah, yeah. I, I I've had some interesting experiences over the last year writing this in this area, but that's um, all the more reason to write about it. Mm. Frankly, I, I understand that it's quite difficult to write about it from India. You know, they're having some, they're exploring a bit of a nadir in. Press freedom in India at the uh, at, at the moment. Uh, we have it; it's a luxury, and uh, and I'm you know, determined to, to make use of it. It's it's not like we're you know writing in the Ukraine or we're not in Gaza. Mm. It's fundamentally what we do is pretty trivial, frankly, and we might as well have fun with it. Mm. Yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, so if you're out there, more power to your riding elbow. <laughs> Can you, like, help us with the comments on YouTube? And <laughs> never read the comments, Sam. Never read the comments. Never go below the line. That way, mad I was saying you go below the line. <laughs> <in> the Australian. <laughs> oh, you're going to miss that, awesome. actually. You're miss that. One of my highlights of my subscription. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. I won't go broke. Yeah. <laughs> See you later, chaps. You won't even notice I've gone. Uh, well, yeah, well, we've, we've noticed you've gone, Gideon. It's good. And I think a lot of people who are listening to the show will, um, will at least be uh, – Pleased to know what the actual situation is, so we'll um, look forward to reading you in some guys or other, and uh, and hopefully uh, cricket etc comes back in some guys or other, and all of that can be sorted out. Um, when we had some bad experiences with News Limited, we got Kevin Rudd on the following week to, <laughs> to discuss the Murdoch Royal Commission. <laughs> so I don't know if you've been in touch with Kevin. Uh, <laughs> Just to help out, <laughs> but um, it's uh, always a pleasure to have you in. Uh, I, I know you were going to go to training, but you don't go to indoor nets. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But, but but really, yeah, great to have you on, mate. Thank you so much. Look, I, I should say, I, I, like, really, I really enjoyed my time at the Oz. Mm. You know, and I love the idea of a national broadsheet daily. I think it's a really, really worthwhile project. And the fundamental reason I'm leaving is because I want to do other things, uh, and you know, I've got a limited time to to do that. So I might as well take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, so no hard feelings. I would like to do the podcast again. Mm. We had a great time doing it. But if it doesn't work out that way, then I'm not fast. Mm. We'll make sure to edit that bit out. But Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gideon, hey, thanks so much. No worries. Wasn't that a wonderful chat with Gideon? That was just nice. <laughs> One of the best. Yeah. Had to cut out a fair bit about you know things he said, but you know, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, hashtag RCDC Pez, which is of course brought to you by Ponting Wines, where you can co- you can use the code get a few for twenty percent off at pontingwines.com.au. Pontingwines.com.au. Use the code get a few, all one word, for twenty percent off your purchase. Mm. Uh, as we like to do from time to time, pairs, or in fact each week for hashtag Ask TGC, uh, we should be speaking. Uh, we should be looking at pontingwines.com.au. And what do you want to talk about today? What do you fancy right now? Good one. Okay, I'm coming down. Coming down. We got given a whole bunch of ponting wines as well. Yeah, uh, we did. Want to come to we the, did. Uh, the studio. Uh, what about ponting? Ponting top order Adelaide Hills Chardonnay. Okay, 2022. Now, when they've chosen those words very well, because. I'm going to – this may be controversial to you. Okay. But when I think about Ricky Ponting in his absolute fucking pomp. <laughs> yep. Sorry. Yes. That is crass. It's vile. I envisage him batting three in like a indomitable summer yep. at – the Adelaide Oval, the old Adelaide Oval. Like yes. I, I don't even know what his record is there. Before I'm, the drop in, I'm going to yeah. guess that that was where he scored most of his runs. Uh, Should we look it up? Yeah. Uh, okay. Ricky Ponting. What are we looking at? Averages by ground. Where did Ricky Ponting score most of his runs? Performance analysis by ground. Ricky Ponting. Oh, this, this is first look. Okay. Um, oh, wow, it's got everything. No. So, so Adelaide is at the top because it starts with A. Yeah. Uh, 17 matches, 31 innings. High score, 242. Average 60.1. How many centuries? Uh, and 600s at Adelaide Oval. So he oh, had, no, so MCG was more. Really? Yes, yeah, seven. Seven at, okay, at the MCG, but an average of 58.1. Uh, okay, higher average at Adelaide. Higher average at Adelaide. Uh, how many, so 660s at Adelaide, how many at the MCG? Zero. So... 12 scores at Adelaide Oval. Uh, mm. Brisbane Cricket Ground, four tons, 1050s, an average of 63. A lot of people might have been like, Gabba, they couldn't get him out. Does that mean Ponting's got seven Boxing Day hundreds? It would, yeah. That can fucking, what the fuck? Nah, seven Boxing no, Day hundreds. No, it's four. You're in the wrong column. I'm looking at it now. I'm it's looking at four. list of international cricket centuries. Oh, international. So international. You've got, so you got 41 international hundreds. See, I'm not looking at tests. tests. You're looking at tests. 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 Okay, I'm tests. tests. Okay, yeah. I, was, I mean, international is probably a better stat. Uh, yeah, no, but people, everything just what people nah, see. But no, but in Australia. I, I think, of, I think nah, of test cricket. Yeah, but in Australia, people don't do – how many international hundreds? Yeah, how many yeah. test hundreds? Yeah. yeah. 23 catches at Adelaide Oval as well, bettered only by – no but, Ponting, no, but Ponting got like 75 international hundreds, didn't he? He did get, he get 41 tests. What am I talking about? 
What's going on? We're getting confused. We're talking about his wine here, by the way. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But For, I'm on, I was, 41 see, test I'm hundreds. on fucking, yeah, I'm on Wikipedia. Get off Wikipedia, Andy. Come on. Mm. Sort your shit out. Yeah. Do you, didn't he get like, so he got 75 international hundreds because Coley was going to go past him or some shit. Yeah, who knows? 70, 71. 71 international <laughs> hundreds. Just barking numbers in. Yeah. It's time for stat, the stat dog. Uh, which <laughs> It's time for... No, not doing no. that again. <laughs> it's too much. People are just probably going to sleep by yeah. now. Uh, anyway, but your point being about... Point being, just Adelaide... Top order, top, like number they, three. They know, yeah, the number gra- three. The graphite kookaburra. Yeah, the bl- and the just the, what, the, the, the picket fences at the old Adelaide Oval as well. Yes. Just, walk, just walking out, slightly shaky, yeah. uh, a, gr- a grainier camera than the, I know the you 4K, mean. 8K. Yes, um, sort of 720p sort days. of era. Yeah, yeah seven, 720p pixelation. Yes. Uh, and... Uh, and picket fences and and Ponting's lid and just and just runs at Adelaide mm. Oval. The top order Adelaide Hills Chardonnay. Yeah. Okay. Imagine, okay. I see what you're saying. Imagine yeah. a Chardonnay on the hill there at Adelaide Oval. A Ponting wine Chardonnay watching the great man yep. with the forearms going out to bat. Yeah. Mm. We're so fortunate to have so many great grounds in Australia, but. Mm. Adelaide. And we've been so lucky to experience all of them now. Yeah. But like, fuck, Adelaide. Adelaide's Adelaide. number one. Adelaide's number one. Um, Adelaide, so the Adelaide test is a day test this year. Yeah. Which is, that, that's a win, I think. It's a win for fucking Brisbane, who've got the night test. Yeah. The, the Olympic City. Yeah, we don't want to see it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't want to disrespect Brisbane right now. They don't need a drive-by. But, um, I'm not ground. giving a drive-by. I'm no, 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 you. I'm them. talking about me. I was okay, I just right. had something coming in and out of the old uh, noggin. Oh, there. the old noggin there. Yeah. <laughs> the old Travis. Uh, the old Travis head. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah, white wine... Chardonnay, yes, please. Adelaide Oval, yes. top order. It's all connected. Isn't RT Ponte, RT Ponte. Get out of here! And it's a good drop. It's a very, very good drop. What do you get here, guys? Twenty percent off when you use the code. Get a few at pontingwines.com.au. Hashtag AskTGC. Do you want to go? Yeah, Naveen writes in. I'm just going to keep this uh, time yeah, going. Go on, then. Yeah. yeah, hashtag AskTGC. No, this is from Naveen. <laughs> yeah, mangoes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> bowled, he bowled well for Afghanistan the other night. Well. Yeah, yeah, he did bowl well. Because it's the same name. Yeah, that's right. right. So, says Naveen, <laughs> last night, after basking in the glory of the Bears' sumptuous innings against Afghanistan, he's referring to Roach, yeah, yeah. with his impressively broad willow, I headed to bed with all the safety of an Australian fan seeing their team in a grand final. Mm-hmm. That safety, it seemed, melted deep into the dark crevices of the id parts of my brain for as i dipped my toes into the sweet lucid tides of rem sleep (laughs) lapping at the coastline of my consciousness i was greeted by the welcoming and rather striking face of the current australian cricket captain strolling along the sands leaving a distinct trail of steps along a path i'm sure i had walked on but had no remaining footprints to show the efforts of my labors Mm. Had he carried me all this way, I pondered, in the subconscious of my subconsciousness, with an unfamiliar sense of pleasure in the potential wonder of the unknown, and the sense of purpose one can glean from rich expectations. Expectations, sorry. With with his deepest green eyes, earnest lips and chiselled jawline, he called out to me, reminding me to return to his hotel room with him. Not long after his ethereal yet enchanting petition did I find myself opposite a homely fire, beset in a modern fireplace with all the silver edges and minimal minimal architecture that served to enhance the seething embers that danced upon charred logs, cut and smoothened to perfection. (coughs) Across from me was a large king-sized bed with rich ebony supports and a gold filigree inlay of Zari tessellations adorning a grand (laughs) bedhead. Fucking hell. This is dripping uh, yeah. in uh, words, wordplay. The mattress was wrapped in ruffled sheets and velvet quilts lavishly dashed across them. Shades of deep vermilion, vermilion, juxtaposed with duck feathered <laughs> pillows dressed in Kodiak brown covers of silly, silky damask. Fuck me. I found myself adorned in an off-white satin robe and not much else, confused, bemused, but altogether safe. Or so I thought. Suddenly, out from the corner of my eyeline, appeared Pat Cummins, wrapped in nothing but a towel balancing precariously under his hip bones, Mm -hmm. making his way towards me with all the swagger of a man who knows he's an exquisite lover. There was a longing in his eyes that scared me, but perhaps slightly more than it excited me. 
It's time, he insisted, wandering closer with an assuredness and an eagerness to his voice that made me bite my lip, but also feel immediately vulnerable. He slowly sat down on his bed and swung his legs onto the mattress, making a full show of his smooth and rhythmic action. It's time for you to do it, he insisted, somewhat ominously, as he motioned towards his feet that were unfurled in my direction. I've prepared the pot. It's time to wax my feet. (laughs) Blatant, brusque, and straight to the point, he conjured a warm pot of some depilatory concoction and and an array of waxing spatulas in a variety of sizes. His eyes grew impatient and expectant. His loving caress of a gaze had clearly morphed into a stern glare, and he kicked his feet toward me, braying like a mare in heat. (laughs) I was rather terrified and worried he may make an unwarranted move at me, and in all my fear found myself running out the door, pot of warm wax in hand, worrying how the hell I had ended up there and whether my robe would hold as I stumbled to what I hoped was safety. As I approached the hotel lobby, I tripped on the creased carpet and barreled towards the revolving door encased in golden frames and a bright volley of refracting light that obscured any view of the outside in dizzying coruscations. (laughs) Suddenly, strong arms grabbed my shoulders and chest before I face-planted onto cold marble tiles. I looked up at my rescuer, only to find myself face-to-face with my captor, the enigmatic Pat Cummins. (coughs) A forbidding smirk sprayed across his glassy visage. I shot fear into the very depths of my being. I woke in a sweat, not sure what to make of what I had just witnessed. I'm still in shock, to be fair, and left wondering what, uh, as to what it all meant and why it happened to me. I'm struggling without an outlet or an explanation, and I'm hoping the boys can help me out here. What does, all, what does it all mean, fellas? What does it mean? I'm really at a loss here. Please help me out. <coughs> um, well, Naveen, um, you're gay. You are gay. <laughs> that's that's what that means, man. Um, <laughs> that was one of the most ridiculously that was verbose. That, that was like that was fairly dripping <laughs> in prose. Oh, I can I can. Uh, I, I can feel the like smooth wax of his words <laughs> just l- lathering up my skin and my mind, my soul. Oh goodness. Yeah. That was that was a that was a, a rich prose experience. Uh much of that's true. Or was that just erotic fiction that he was writing like about just Pat Cummins? Straight up fanfic. It was just, just like erotic fanfic. That, that felt like erotic fan fiction. From a man that wanted to physically be with Pat Cummins. And I don't think that's an outlandish accusation. Not an accusation. Observation. I, was, I liked, just in the construction of the prose, I, I felt like it was so, like, verbose and, like, dr- drippingly overwritten. Yeah. I was hoping that at some point it would, like, um, sharply juxtaposed mm-hmm. with some like <laughs> some fucking nasty <laughs> short sentenced mm. who's uh, the alpha yeah 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 like <laughs> short sentence yeah. um kind of uh like uh, what's what's a word like just 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 dirty um to like juxtapose kind of, the yeah the like drippingness a, of the yeah like just verbosity. like full full drippingly verbose into yeah. just something nasty and yeah. short yeah you know didn't quite get there like it was just like what what did Cummins want he wanted his feet waxed yeah uh, I'm just thinking from a fan fiction construction perspective. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you really wanted that sort of punch. Yeah. Could, could have gone to something short and punchy. Yeah. Uh, like really, really smacked us in the yeah. face and like, and mister, misdirected us. Yeah. You know, what would you like? What would you want to kind of, uh, I work out with cum on my face. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was thinking more like he just, he just, he just wanted some throwdowns, you know, or something like that or. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Have options, re- yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Could make it feel like a choose your own adventure stuff there, but uh, I don't know. Appreciate the time you've uh, you've you've put into keep that. us a, keep us abreast if those uh, dreams persist. Sure, yeah, 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 uh, and um, and also you know, 
like a, a, it needs to be said as cliche as it is. If he's gay, and he is, all good. Like play on. Yeah, it's play on. Um, in, Naveen Naveen may be gay. Like he's just like, what does that mean? It's like you've you've had a you've had a you've got you've had a sexual wanting. You've for, had a sexual wanting for oh, Australia's sexual, Pat Cummins. A, yeah, and it's fairly obvious. And you know, look, I can't say I've had a an equivalent dream like that about Pat Cummins. Not yet. That is, that is as uh, like rich in kind of um, fucking subtext and foreplay. Because we've all had them, but not as rich. That's in, what I'm in, saying, not, yeah. not, not as rich. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, a yeah, lot yeah. of people who have had sexual dreams about Pat Cummins. Yeah, it's a probably, probably just cut to the pornographic chase. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to guess. Probably get straight to those little lines on the bar there. <laughs> That I'm told about. <laughs> it's been time stamped. He's a lot of people probably cut to the time yeah. stamp rather than the mm. the 25 minute prelude. Some yeah. may not. Some may have more time. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> some have some have more time than others. Yeah. <laughs> different frogs, different times. Uh, as a oh, great yeah. man once said. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much to Shane Watson for joining the show. Thank you very much for to Gideon Hay for joining the show. <laughs> Only <laughs> to, Gideon knew how to come next. <laughs> to, to, <laughs> two luminaries of the game and finishing of Naveen's wonderful question about Pat Cummins. Uh, I hope you've had a wonderful week. Have a great week this week. I hope your team is doing good things. I hope you're doing great things as well. We'll be back right here on The Great Cricketer basically every day on the internet if you want to find us. Join us on Patreon for all the fun there. And we'll see you guys on this here podcast next week. Next week. Cheers.